Chapter 4 Lore Adventures of the Black Fox Born Lord Rima Vaskal in 1863 Bless, the Black Fox was a dashing thief and rogue, who went on to inspire so many tales of his exploits that is nearly impossible to determine today which are true and which are merely fabricated legend. Despite coming from nobility, he has become something of a hero to the common people. His initial exploits involved ridiculing the tyrannical and powerful Lord of Valshaven. Wearing a mask, he would appear in public and disrupt the Lord's plans to the point that the Lord angrily put a huge bounty on the life of this cunning fox, the origin of the nickname, which stuck. That the primary bounty hunter who took the job, Carolus, ended up becoming Rima's lifelong partner in crime, only after nearly killing him several times, is one of the most popular tales told in taverns today. The story is often exaggerated to make Rima appear initially buffoonish, until Carolus became so furious at the Black Fox's inexplicable ability to survive that the cunning Rima gains the upper hand, which impresses Carolus so much that the bounty hunter joins him. After years of terrorizing the Lord's men and foiling his tax collectors, a favorite pastime of Rimai's, according to the Orlesian commoners, Rimai was supposedly betrayed by his lover Servana de Montfort, in some versions of the tale a mage of the circle, no less, and was captured. After more than a year of torture, Rimai was rescued from a prison by his compatriots, including Arempen and Servana, and together they escaped Orle. In this period of Rimai's adventures, he appears almost everywhere in Thedas. As his legend grew, more innkeepers and merchants were happy to claim that the Black Fox had visited their village or establishment and performed some legendary feat. If the tales are to be believed, Rimai led the Lord's men on a merry chase. He became embroiled in a po political intrigue in Navarra, was hunted by anti the Antivan crowds, and then kidnapped by a powerful mage in the winter. In each situation, Rima escaped death at the last moment, foiled by evil doer, and improved life for the poor and the downtrodden. Then, in inevitably, he rejoined his band of adventurers and moved on to the next clan. His companions Carolus and Servana, the wise dwarf Polek, and the tes tempestuous knight Sir Clementus, have each spawned their own individual legends over the years. The stories all agree that, at some point, the Black Fox disappeared. He and his fellow adventurers voyaged into the heart of Arlathan Forest, seeking the sunken city of the elves, and never returned. Many more are the tales that expand on what ultimately happened to them in that forest and postulate on how they could sadly be rescued. From The Adventures of the Black Fox by Gaston Geralt 9-11 Dragon Alienage Culture There have been alienage for as long as elves and shems have lived in the same lands. The sa <coughs> they say that Valrio has 10,000 elves living in a space no bigger than Denerim's market. Their walls are supposedly so high that daylight doesn't reach the Venadal until midday. But don't be so anxious to start tearing down the walls and picking fights with the guards. They keep out more than they keep in. We don't have to live here, you know. Sometimes a family gets a good break, and they buy a house in the docks or the outskirts of town. If they're lucky, they come back to the alienage after the looters have burned down their house. The unlucky ones just go to the pauper's field. Here we're among family. We look out for each other. Here we do what we can to remember the old days. The flat ears who have gone out there, they're stuck. They'll never be human, and they've gone and thrown away being elven, too. So where does that leave them? Nowhere. Sarethia, Haran of the High Ever Alienage. Ambrosia. Felicitous area, commonly known as the Silent Plains Rose, is to this day the only plant found growing on the Silent Plains, which were taken by the blight a thousand years ago. As mentioned in the section on rare flowering plants, Felicitous Aria is not technically a rose, though its flowers do exude a sweet, rose-like scent. The flower is rare, and is in danger of becoming extinct because of its value to in the creation of ambrosia, which is distilled from the roots of the plant. 
dozens of these plants go into the making of just one vial. Some say that wives of the most powerful Tevinter magisters once used ambrosia to perfume their baths in a vulgar display of wealth. An excerpt from the Botanical Compendium by Ines Arencia, botanist. The Amel family. It's truly sad what happened to the Amels, isn't it? I still remember grandmother take, talking about the balls that Lord Arisatide used to hold at their estate and the Antivan violin players and dancers from Asana. No expense was spared and no one would dare miss it, lest someone think they weren't worthy of an invitation. And then poor Revka had the child. Magical talent, running in one of the Kirkwall's most prominent families? The Templars had considered Lord Aristide to be Viscount after Frenholt's arrest. Can you imagine the scandal had he been chosen? They whisked the child away to the circle, and the ML simply had no luck after that. Leandra ran off with a Ferelden mage, and then Damien was accused of smuggling. Poor Lord Faustin almost bankrupted his family trying to get the charges dropped, but I hear Viscount Marlowe simply wanted to get the Amels out of the picture. And it worked too, didn't it? By the time Lord Faustin got sick, there was only young Gamlin left, and a mountain of debt. I spoke to Dolce just the other day, and apparently Gamlin is now living in some low town shack. Sounds like the sort of character you'd cross a street to avoid. And let's not even talk about the estate. Mother says we should remember the Amels because that sort of thing can happen to any of us. You know the old saying, a martyr's fortune rises and falls with the tide. If you ask me, this is just another misfortune that magic brings to honest folk. And Rusty helped that poor family, whatever lies in store for them. Excerpt from a letter written by Lady Amelie de Montfort Andraste, Bride of the Maker There was once a tiny fishing village on the waking sea that was set upon the Tevinter Imperium, which enslaved the villages to be sold in the markets of Mratus, leaving behind only the old and the infirm. One of the captives was the child Andraste. She was raised in slavery in a foreign land. She escaped, and then made the long, treacherous journey back to her homeland alone. She rose from nothing to be with the wife of an Alamari warlord. Each day she sang to the gods, asking them to help her people who remained slaves in the winter. The false gods of the mountains and the winds did not answer her, but the true god did. The maker spoke. He showed her all the works of his hands, the fade, the world, and all the creatures therein. She showed her how men had forgotten him, lavishing devotion upon mute idols and demons, and how he had left them to their fate. But her voice had reached him, and so captivated him that he offered her a place at his side, that she might rule all of creation. But Andraste would not forsake her people. She begged the Maker to return, to save his children from the cruelty of the Imperium. Reluctantly, the maker agreed to give men another chance. Andraste went back to her husband, Mathurath, and told him all that the maker had revealed to her. Together they rallied the Alamari and marched forth against the mage lords of the Imperium, and the maker was with them. The maker's sword was creation itself, fire and blood, famine and earthquake. Everywhere they went, Andraste sang to the people of the Maker, and they heard her. The ranks of Andraste's followers grew until they were a vast tide washing over the Imperium. And when Matharav saw that the people loved Andraste and not him, a worm grew within his heart, gnawing upon him. At last the armies of Andraste and Matharav stood before the very gates of Inratus, but Andraste was not with them for Matharav had schemed in secret to hand Andraste over to the Tevinter. For this, the Archon would give Matharav all the lands to the south of the Waking Sea. And so, before all the armies of the Alamari and of Tevinter, 
and Raste was tied to a stake and burned, while her earthly husband turned his armies aside and did nothing, for his heart had been devoured. But as he watched the pyre, the archon softened. He took pity on Andraste, and drew his sword, and granted her the mercy of a quick death. The maker wept for his beloved, cursed Matharath, cursed mankind for their betrayal, and turned once again from creation, taking only Andraste with him. And Our Lady stood still at his side, where she still urges him to take pity on his two children. From the Sermons of Justinia the Second. Arlathan. Before the ages were named or numbered, our people were glorious and eternal and never changing. Like the great oak tree, they were constant in their traditions, strong in the roots, and ever reaching for the sky. They felt no need to rush when life was endless. They worshipped their gods for months at a time. Decisions came after decades of debate, and an introduction could last for years. From time to time our ancestors would drift into centuries-long slumber, but this was not death, for we knew they wandered the fade and dreams. In those ages our people called all the land Elvenan, which in the old Elven language means place of our people. And at the center of the world stood the great city of Arlathan, a place of knowledge and debate, where the best of the ancient elves would go to trade knowledge, greet old friends, and settle disputes that had gone on for millennia. But while our ancestors were caught up in the forever cycle of ages, drifting through life at what we today would consider an intolerable pace, the world outside, the lush forests and ancient trees, were changing. The humans first arrived from Parvolen to the north, called Shemlen, or Quicklings, by the ancients. The humans were pitiful creatures whose lives blinked by an, an instant. When they first met the elves, the humans were brash and warlike, quick to anger and quicker to fight with no patience for the unhurried pace of elven diplomacy. But the humans brought worse things than war with them. Our ancestors proved susceptible to human diseases, and for the first time in history elves died of natural causes. What's more, those elves who spent time bartering and negotiating with humans found themselves aging, tainted by the humans' brush and impatient lives. Many believed that the ancient gods had judged them unworthy of their long lives, and cast them down among the quicklings. Our ancestors came to look upon the humans as parasites, which I understand is similar to the way the humans see our people in the cities. The ancient elves immediately moved to close Elven and off from the humans, for fear that this quickening effect would crumble the civilization. You ask what happened to Arlathan? Sadly, we do not know. Even those of us who keep the ancient lore have no record of what truly happened. What we have are accounts of the days before the fall, and a fable of the whims of the gods. The human world was changing even as the elves slept. Clans and tribes gave way to a powerful empire called the Winter, which, and for what reason we do not know, moved to conquer Elvenan. When they breached the great city of Arlathan, our people, fearful of disease and loss of immortality, chose to flee rather than fight. With magic, demons, and even dragons at their behest, the Tevinter Imperium marched easily for Arlathan, destroying homes and galleries and amphitheaters that had stood for ages. Our people were corralled as slaves, and human contact quit in their veins until every recaptured elf turned mortal. The elves called to their ancient gods, but there was no answer. As to why the gods didn't answer, our people left only a legend. They say that Fenharel, the dread wolf and lord of tricksters, approached the ancient gods of good and evil and proposed a truce. 
the gods of good would remove themselves to heaven, and the lords of evil would exile themselves to the abyss, neither group ever again to enter the other's lands. But the gods did not know that Fenharel had planned to betray them, and by the time they realized the dread wolf's treachery, they were sealed in their respective realms, never again to interact with the mortal world. It is a fable, to be sure, but those elves who travel the beyond claim that Fenharel still roams the world of dreams, keeping watch over the gods lest they escape from their presence. Whatever the case, Arlathan had fallen to the very humans our people had once considered mere pests. It is said that the Tevinter Magisters used their great destructive power to force the very ground to swallow Arlathan whole, destroying eons of collected knowledge, culture, and art. The Hall of Elven Lore, left only to memory. The Fall of Arlathan as told by Gisharel, keeper of the Ralafarin clan of the Dalish elves. Beyond the Veil Spirits and Demons It is challenging enough for the casual observer to tell the difference between the Fade and the creatures that live within it, let alone between one type of spirit and another. In truth, there is little that distinguishes them, even for the most astute mages. Since spirits are not physical entities and are therefore not restricted to rec recognizable forms, or even having a form at all, one can never tell for certain what is alive and what is merely a part of the scenery. It is therefore advisable for the inexperienced researcher to greet all objects he encounters. Typically, we misuse the term spirit to refer only to the benign, or at least less malevolent, creatures of the Fade. But in truth, all the denizens of the realm beyond the Fade are spirits. As the chant of light notes, everything within the Fade is a mimicry of our world, a poor imitation, for the spirits do not remotely understand what they are coping. It is no surprise that much of the Fade appears like a manuscript, translated from Tevinter into Orlesian and back again by drunken initiates. In general, spirits are not complex, or rather, they are not complex as we understand such things. Each one seizes upon a single facet of human experience. Rage, hunger, compassion, hope, etc. This one idea becomes their identity. We classify as demons those spirits who identify themselves with darker human emotions and ideas. The most common and weakest form of demon one encounters in the Fade is the Rage Demon. They are much like perpetually boiling kettles, for they exist only to vent hatred, but rarely have an object to hate. Somewhat above these are the Hunger Demons, who do little but eat or to attempt to eat everything they encounter, including other demons. This is rarely successful. Then there are the Sloth Demons. These are the first intelligent creatures one typically finds in the Fade. They are dangerous only on those rare occasions that they can be induced to get up and do harm. Desire demons are more clever and far more powerful, using all forms of bribery to induce mortals into their realms. Wealth, love, vengeance, whatever lies closest to your heart. The most powerful demons yet encountered are the pride demons, perhaps because they, among all their kind, most resemble men. From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons, by Enchanter Mayfromo Blood Magic, The Forbidden School Foul and corrupt are you, who have taken my gift and turned it against my children. Transfigurations, 1810 The ancient Tevinters did not originally consider blood magic a school of its own. Rather, they saw it as a means of to achieve greater power in any school of magic. The name, of course, refers to the fact that magic of this type uses life, specifically in the form of blood, instead of mana. It was a common practice at one time for a magister to keep a number of slaves on hand so that, should he undertake the working of a spell that was physically beyond his abilities, he could use the blood of his slaves to bolster the casting. 
Over time, however, the Imperium discovered types of spell that could only be worked by blood. Although Lyrium will allow a mage to send his conscious mind into the Fade, blood would allow him to find the sleeping minds of others, view their dreams, and even influence or dominate their thoughts. Just as treacherous, blood magic allows the veil to be opened completely so that demons may physically pass through into a world. The rise of the Chant of Light and the subsequent fall of the old Imperium has led to blood magic being all but stamped out, as it should be, for it poses nearly as great danger to those who would practice it as to the world at large. From The Four Schools, a treatise, by First Enchanter Josephus. Theta's Calendar For most good folk, the details of our calendar have little purpose. It is useful only for telling them when the Summer Day Festival will be held, when the snows are expected to begin, and when the harvest must be complete. The naming of the years are a matter for historians and taxmen, and few, if pressed, could even tell you the reason that our current age is named after dragons. It is 930 Dragon Age, the thirtieth year in the ninth age since the crowning of the Chantry's first divine. Each age is exactly 100 years, with the next age's name chosen in the 1990th year. The scholars in Val Rio advised the Chantry of pertinent scene in that 19th year, and Chantry authorities pour over the research for months before the Divine announces the name of the imminent age. The name is said to be an omen of what is to come, of what the people of Thedas will face for the next hundred years. The current age was not meant to be the Dragon Age. Throughout the last months of the Blessed Age, the Chantry was preparing to declare the Sun Age, named up for the symbol of the Orlesian Empire, which at the time sprawled over much of the south of Thedas and controlled both Ferelden and what is now Navarra. It was to be a celebration of Orlesian Imperial glory. But as the rebellion in Ferelden reached ahead and the Battle of River Dane was about to begin, a peculiar event occurred, a rampage, the rising of a dreaded high dragon. Dragons had been thought practically extinct since the days of the Navarron dragon hunts, and they say that to see this great beast rise from the frost bags was both majestic and terrifying. As the rampage began and the high dragon decimated the countryside in its search for food, the elderly divine Faustine II abruptly declared this the Dragon Age. Some say the Divine was declaring support for Olay in the battle against Ferelden, since the dragon is an element of the Dufile family heraldry of King Megron, the so-called usurper king of Ferelden. Be that as it may, the High Dragon's rampage turned towards the Orlesian side of the Frostback Mountains, killing hundreds and sending thousands more fleeing to the northern coast. The Ferelden rebels won the Battle of River Dane, ultimately securing their independence. Many thus think that the Dragon Age will come to represent a time of violent and dramatic change for all of Thedas. It remains to be seen. From the Studious Theologian, by Werder Genetivi, Chantry Scholar, 925 Dragon. The Cardinal Rules of Magic You must not be under the misimpression that magic is all-powerful. There are limits, and not even the greatest mages may overcome them. Not one, for instance, has found any means of traveling, either over great distances or small ones, beyond putting one foot in front of the other. The immutable nature of the physical world prevents this. So, no, you may not simply pop over to Minratus to borrow a cup of sugar, nor may you magic the essay you forgot in the apprentice dormitory to your desk. You will simply have to be prepared. Similarly, even when you send your mind into the fade, your body remains behind. Only once the piss barrier has been overcome, and repeatedly the spell required two-thirds of the lyrium in the Tevimter Imperium as well as the lifeblood of several hundred slaves. The results were utterly disastrous. Finally, life is finite. A truly great healer may bring someone back from the very precipice of death, when breath and heartbeat have ceased by the spirit still clings to life. But once the spirit has fled the body, it cannot be recalled. That is no failing of your skills or power. 
It is simple reality. From the lectures of the first enchanter, Wenzelus. The Carta. The castless dwarves of Orzammar had few prospects. Consigned to live in a crumbling ruin of the social and economic fringes of the mighty dwarven capital, most resort to begging, prostitution, or crime. Just as all rivers eventually join the sea, all castles who turn to crime eventually become a part of the Carta. The hero of Ferrol then decimated the ranks of this ancient gang while rallying the dwarves to join in the battle against the arch demon Urthemio. Unable to recover the power they once had in Orzammar, they turned their attention topside, using groups of service-dwelling dwarves to smuggle weapons, lyrian, sulfurous luxuries, people, and other goods between Orzammar and human lands. Despite the flow of business, its members are still desperate and violent. With no strong leader to ring in their excesses, they have little sense of dwarven honor, and freely break their world, double-cross allies, and renege on deals. From the Stone and Her Children, Dwarves of the Graduate Dragon Age, by Brother Genetivi. Chantry Hierarchy The Divine is the titular head of the Chantry. Although since the schism split the Imperial Chantry into its own faction, there are now in fact two Divines at any one time. One Divine, informally called the White Divine, is a woman housed in the Grand Cathedral in Varigoyo. The other, known as the Black Divine, is a man housed in the Argent Spire in Minrathus. Neither Divine recognizes the existence of the other, and the informal names are considered sacrilegious. No matter the gender, a Divine is addressed as Most Holy, or Your Perfection. Beneath the rank of Divine is the Grand Cleric. Each Grand Cleric presides over numerous chantries and represents the highest religious authority for their region. They travel to Valerio when the College of Clerics convenes, but otherwise remain where they are assigned. All Grand Clerics are addressed as Your Grace. Beneath the Grand Cleric is the Mother, or in the Imperial Chantry, the Father. If a Mother is in charge of a particular Chantry, revered is appended to her title. These are the priests responsible for administering the spiritual well-being of their flock. A mother or revered mother is addressed by your reverence. Brothers and sisters form the rank and file of the chantry and consist of the three main groups, affirmed, initiates, and clerics. Affirmed are the lay brethren of the chantry, those regular folk who have turned to the chantry for saxer. Often they are people who have fled a difficult or irreligious life and have chosen to go into seclusion or even orphans and similar unfortunates who have raised into chantry life. The affirmed take care of the chantry and are in turn offered a life and quiet contemplation, no questions asked. Only those folk who have take vows become initiates. These are men and women in training, whether in academic knowledge or the martial skills of a warrior. All initiates receive an academic ed education although only those who seek to become Templars learn how to fight in addition. Clerics are the true academics of the Chantry, those men and women who have dedicated themselves to the pursuit of knowledge. They are often found in Chantry archives, sages presiding over libraries of books and arcane knowledge. The most senior of these clerics placed in charge of such archives are given the title Elder, although such a rank is still beneath that of a mother. All other brothers and sisters are addressed simply by noting their title before the name, such as a brother genitivi. From a guide for ambassadors from Ravain. The City Elves When the holy exalted march of the Dales resulted in the dissolution of the Elven Kingdom, leaving a great many elves homeless once again, the divine Renata I declared that all lands loyal to the Chantry must give the elves refuge within their own walls. Considering the atrocities committed by the elves at Red Crossing, this was a great testament to the Chantry's charity. 
There was one condition, however. The elves were to lay aside their pagan gods and live under the rule of the Chantry. Some of the elves refused our goodwill. They banded together to form the wandering Dalish elves, keeping their old elven ways and their hatred of humans alive. To this day, Dalish elves still terrorize those of us who stray too close to their camps. Most of the elves, however, saw that it was wisest to live under the protection of humans. And so we took the elves into our cities and tried to integrate them. We invited them into our own homes and gave them jobs as servants and farmhands. Here in Denerim, the elves even have their own quarter governed by an elven keeper. Most have proven to be productive members of society. Still, a small segment of the elven community remains dissatisfied. These troublemakers and malcontents roam the streets causing mayhem, rebelling against authority and making a general nuisance of themselves. From Ferelden, Folklore and History by Sister Petrine, Chantry Scholar The Coterie Kirkwall is built on a solid foundation of greed and human suffering, and its underworld is a place where everything is for sale and everyone is fair game. There are many criminal empires within the city, some of which have been around since the Imperium used Kirkwall as a hub in the slave trade. Alliances, spying, manipulation, betrayal, and open warfare is all commonplace in the never-ending struggle for power. The Coterie is a thieves' guild that has been around for almost a century, but until recently was never a major player in the underworld. Some twenty years ago, the strongest of the local criminal empires was an ancient guild known as the Sabratham, but its leader was betrayed from within, and during the turmoil the Kauri made a successful grab for power. Since then, they've sunk their claws into almost every level of Kirkwall, including the city guard, the dwarven merchants guild, and some of the most influential citizens in the city. It's safe to say that the Kauri gets a slice of every pie, and very little goes on in Kirkwall that escapes their notice. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genetivi The Dalish Elves I took the road north from Valrio toward Navarra with a merchant caravan. A scant two days past the Orlesian border, we were beset by bandits. They struck without warning from the cover of the trees hammering our wagons with arrows, killing most of the caravan guards instantly. The few who survived the arrow storm drew their blades and charged into the trees after our attackers. We heard screams muffled by the forest, and then nothing more of those men. After a long silence, the bandits appeared, elves covered in tattoos and dressed in hides. They looted all the supplies and valuables they could carry from the merchants, and disappeared back into the trees. These, I was later in informed, were the Dalish, the wild elves who lurk in the wilderness on the fringes of settled lands, preying upon travelers and isolated farmers. These wild elves have reverted to the worship of their false gods, and rumored to practice their own form of magic, rejecting all human society. From In Pursuit of Knowledge the Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genetivi Darkspawn Those who had sought to claim heaven by violence destroyed it. What was golden and pure turned black. Those who had once been mage lords, the brightest of their age, were no longer men, but monsters. Fernadis 12.1 Sin was the midwife that ushered the darkspawn into this world. The magisters fell from the golden city, and their fate encompassed all our worlds, for they were not alone. No one knows where the darkspawn come from, a dark mockery of men. In the darkest places they thrive, growing in numbers as a plague of locust will. In raids, they will often take captives, dragging their victims alive into the deep roads, but most evidence suggests that these are eaten. 
Like spiders, it seems darkspawn prefer their food still breathing. Perhaps they are simply spawned by the darkness. Certainly, we know that evil has no trouble perpetuating itself. The last blight was in the Age of Towers, striking once again at the heart of the winter, spreading south into Orlais and east into the Free Marches. The plague spread as far as Ferelden, but the withering and twisting of the land stopped well beyond our borders. Here, Darkspawn have never been more than the stuff of legends. In the northern lands, however, particularly the winter and the underfells, they say Darkspawn haunt the hinterlands, preying out on outlaying farmers and isolated villages, a constant threat. From Frolden, Folklore and History, by Sister Petrine, Gentry Scholar. Death of a Templar The dry, dusty earth swallows up salty drops that splatter its surface. A tiny insect pauses, sensing the vibrations, and scurries off, leaving behind its invisible energy. As the drops fall, the dark circles merge together, expressing a mirror to their creator. The primal emotions of bloodlust and sorrow blend into a lethal cocktail that breaks the strongest of men. The jurisdiction of strength must be left to the spirit, not arm nor chest. Only the wisest turn to his inner sanctuary to partition the mind from an all-consuming madness. Seductive voices whispering promise of glory, waiting down the weaker path of the flesh, bringing a death far worse than that of hot lead or steel. These blank, hollow promises will echo the unfathomable eternally. Living comfortably amongst material possessions, it is easy to misunderstand the true meaning of the uncontrollable hate. Failing to understand the power of fighting against pure, unfaltering beliefs, against foes that listen only to their soul, uncontrollable hate, influenced and thus removed from innocence, the scar is permanent and internal. The rain, now red, feeds the debt owed for actions past, seeking further into the earth as the mind draws slower. What was it that drew him, himself, to this situation? The mind ebbs and parts to a lingering memory of true innocence. He entered war as a newborn enters the world, unknowing of both the horrors and light of the Maker that will save him. The sound of metal sliding along leather comes from above him. From the second he was born, to his soon-to-be-dying breath, his mind was processing and analyzing knowledge and experiences. It is true that he thought he could be wise in his own eyes, but only the most humble recognizes that he knows very little. Bias, speculation and all the false pretenses make way to the sound of sweeping steel, and then, finally, his soul, as ready as his eyes dry from this final understanding enters his promise of its purest form. From Death of a Templar by Sir Andrew Knight of Andraste and Templar Archivist 9-4 Dragon Deathfruit Deathfruit has been used in magic and potion making for centuries. It's a fragile looking plant with thin stalk and purple flowers, which fruits once a year developing bright red fleshy pods that cause disorientation and dizziness if ingested. There are two varieties. The more common Arcanist death fruit was first found by Archon Hadrianus when he discovered it growing on several dead slaves. The other, Lunatic's death fruit, is most closely associated with the story of the courtesan Melusine, who sought revenge on a powerful magister and his family. She harvested the plant, baked it into small pies for the Magister's banquet, and presented them to the Magister at a banquet. All the guests were seized by terrifying hallucinations after eating the pies and tore each other to pieces. An excerpt from the Botanical Compendium by Ines Arancia, Botanist. 
deep mushroom. Deep mushroom refers to the entire group of fungi that grows underground in caves and many parts of the dwarven deep roads. Collection can be a dangerous task, as the deep roads are often infested with darkspawn. Because of this, dwarven merchants often recruit castless hirelings for the job and pay them a meager percentage of what they earn selling the mushrooms to servicers. The most common varieties used in the herbalist trades are the blight cap, ghoul's mushroom, and brimstone mushroom, almost all of which tend to carry the darkspawn corruption. While they cannot transmit the disease, this trait often makes them quite poisonous. Deep mushrooms should only be handled by experienced herbalists and should never be consumed without first being adequately cleaned and prepared. Careless consumption has been known to cause insanity, severe abdominal cramping, and even death. Deep Roads There isn't a dwarf alive who remembers the deep roads as they once were. They were the network of tunnels that joined the tykes together. To be honest, it isn't even right to give them such a simple term as tunnels. They are works of art, with centuries of planning, demonstrated in the geometry of their walls with the statues of the paragons that watch our travelers, with the flow of lava that keeps the deep roads lit and warm. The cloud gazers up on the surface talk of the imperial highway built by the magisters of old, a raised walkway that crossed thousands of miles, something that could only have been built by magic. Perhaps it is comparable to the deep roads, although we dwarves didn't need magic. I suppose it doesn't matter anymore. The darkspawn ruled the deep roads now. When Orzammar sealed off the entrances to the deep roads, abandoning everything that lay out there, we handed over the kingdom that was to those black bastards forever. To think that there are genlocks crawling over Bonamar now, tearing down our statues and defiling our greatest works. Corruption covers everything we built over there. Every dwarf who goes out and comes back says that it gets works with each passing year. The foulness spread a little further. And the cloud gazers think that darkspawn are gone just because they aren't spilling out onto the surface? Huh. One day, when Orzammar is gone for good, they'll find out differently. Those darkspawn won't have anywhere else to go but up, and they'll do it. The surface folk will have themselves a blight that will never end. Transcript of a conversation with a member of the dwarven mining cast. 890 blessed. Demonic Possession Why do demons seek to possess the living? History claims that there are malevolent spirits, the first children of the Maker, angry at their creator for turning them from them, and jealous for those creations have considered superior. They stare across the veil at the living, and do not understand what they see, yet they know they crave it. They desire life. They pull the living across the veil when they sleep and prey on their psyche with nightmares. Whenever they can, they cross the veil into our world to possess it outright. We know that any demon will seek to possess a mage, and upon doing so will create an abomination. Most of the world does not know, however, that the strength of an abomination depends entirely on the power of the demon that possesses the mage. This is true, in fact, of all possessed creatures. One demon is not the same as any other. Demons can, for instance, be classified. Enchanter Brahm's categorization of demons into that portion of the psyche they primarily prey upon has held since the Tower Age. According to Brahm, the weakest and most common demons of those are those of rage. They are the least intelligent and most prone to violent outbursts against the living. They expand their energies quickly, the most powerful of them exhibiting great strength and occasionally the ability to generate fire. Next are the demons of hunger. In a living host they become cannibals and vampires, and within the dead they feed upon the living. Theirs are the powers of draining, both of life force and of mana. Next are the demons of sloth, the first on Bram's scale that are capable of true intelligence. In its true form, this demon is known as a shade, a thing which is nearly indistinct and visible, for such is sloth's nature. It hides and stalks unaware, and when confronted, it sows fatigue and apathy. 
Demons of Desire are amongst the most powerful, and are the ones most likely to seek out the living and actively trick them into a deal. These demons will exploit anything that can be coveted – wealth, power, lust – and they will always end up getting far more than they can give. A desired demon's province is that of illusions and mind control. Strongest of all demons are those of pride. These are the most feared creatures to lose upon the world. Masters of magic and in possessions of vast intellect, they are the true schemers. It is they who seek most strongly to possess mages, and will bring other demons across the veil in numbers to achieve their own ends. Although what that might be has never been discovered. A greater pride demon brought across the veil would threaten the entire world. From the Maker's First Children by Bader, Senior Enchanter of Stuick. 812 Blast. Dragon's Blood. Collecting Dragon's Blood is extremely difficult, even for the most accomplished Dragon Hunter. First, one must locate the increasingly rare creatures. Second, one must bleed it. However, I believe that at the moment of death, the blood loses something special. A certain fiery essence, perhaps. Oh, of course, bleeding a live dragon is quite tricky. Dragon's blood has a wide variety of uses, both magical and culinary. It's an important component of runecrafting, and those like my great-grandfather enjoy a sprinkling of the powdered stuff to their food at the dinner table. From Discovering Dragon's Blood, Potions, Tinctures and Spicy Sauces by Ferdinand Pentagast Elfruit Elfruit was first discovered by the elves of Arlathan, hence the name. The root gave their medicines particular efficiency. So when the Imperium conquered the Elves, the Magisters adopted its use and its popularity spread to all corners of the Empire. Elfruit is a hardy plant with large green leaves that grows wild in many places. It's so common that it tends to show up in most gardens and fields, almost like a weed. Unlike a weed, however, most people appreciate having access to this wonderful little plant. The roots can be used in very little preparation. Rubbing some of the juice on a wound, for example, will speed up healing and numb pain. And chewing on a slice of root treats minor ailments like indigestion, flatulence and hoarse throats. There are several varieties, but the most useful for herbalists are the bitter, gossamer and royal elf roots. An excerpt from the Botanical Compendium by Ines Arencia, botanist. Embryo Embryums are flowers from the orchid family. Its therapeutic qualities were actually discovered because of the embryo's exceptional beauty. The beloved daughter of Lord Ignes Polong of Orlay fell victim to a terrible sickness of the lungs, which her healers were unable to cure. Thinking the girl would soon perish, her parents surrounded her bed with brightly colored flowers, hoping that they would bring some warmth and cheer in her last days. Oddly enough, the girl began to recover from the illness and grew stronger each day. Her parents were baffled, but overjoyed. The heroes eventually learned that the fragrance of one of the flowers eased the child's breathing. The flower was an embryo, and later became known as the Celebrius embryo. The other variant that has certain magical properties is known as Dark Erbium. An excerpt from the Botanical Compendium by Anes Sarencia, botanist. The Enigma of Kirkwall Ancient Tevinter lore is hard to come by, but there's history to be had here in Kirkwall, the city once home to the Imperium slave trade. What answers does Kirkwall hold? Why look here instead of Pariventium or Voldorma? The Imperium does not give up its East secrets easily. Even with the Magister's centuries dead, our journey is perilous. Here on the dock of the gallows, we renew our vows. And should we fail, search for the markings of the Band of Three. A tattered letter found under a cobblestone. It has curious markings and it is signed, the Band of Three. The Viscount is suspicious, but the bribe was sufficient to gain access to the restricted section of the archives. The money would have been better spent elsewhere, the archives being almost devoid of Imperium-era records. When the slaves revolted, 
They hunted magisters and burned the city, at least the parts that could be burned. One account says that the streets were littered with piles of scrolls and books set aflame. Is our quest futile? Did the slaves destroy the answer? As Matharaf's armies toppled the Imperium, they sent three magisters and their legions here. They never arrived. But why march here of all places? What were they coming for? Behind a panel with curious markings, signed the Band of Three. It is as we thought. The quarries of Kirkwall were found after the city was sacked by the Imperium. And after they started constructing the city, the Imperium found the mineral wealth, not the indigenous people. The histories give conflicting accounts on who lived here before the Imperium. Some say the Alamari, some say the Daifads. We do know it was a barbarian people who had little need of the metals in the hills. So why did the Imperium come here in such force? It is hard to disprove Brother Mekel's theory that the natural harbor would be important for their armies, but magisters ruled not common men. What barrier would a simple sea pose to them? The wars with the Alamari wouldn't start until centuries later. Each clue we find only leads to more questions, but we will not give up. Underneath a pile of small boulders carved with curious markings and signed, the Band of Three. In the black alleys of Lowtown, you can find extraordinary things. Priceless tomes of knowledge can be bought with a handful of gold. The Chant of Archon Lovays, a whole chapter of the Midnight Compendium. Some of these books were thought to lost forever. And these are no forgeries. I've verified their authenticity myself. The fences have no inkling that what they're selling has value. Where did these books come from? After several failed attempts, I got my answer underneath the city. There is a hive of hidden passages in Kirkwall's sewers. Now and then a lucky sewer rat comes across an unlooted chamber, and then a cache of ancient Tevinto relics press through the black market. We must search below the city. Underneath a cobblestone, with curious markings, faintly glowing. It is signed, the Band of Three. A maze of caves, sewers, and hidden passages. We found three Tevinter chambers already looted, but today, uh, tonight, we found one closed. It was a small cell containing a few trinkets and a common tome, but it symbolizes hope. The Magisters had hundreds of mages deep below Kirkwall. They lived and researched here, far from the scrutiny of common men. Many ancient cities specialized in arcane research. But why did Kirkwall hide its efforts here? Why go to such great pains to keep it out of sight? Why were they a cabal of renegade magisters, or was this a special project of the Archon? Hidden in a small fissure near curious markings and signed, the Band of Three. A master mason made a comment that the set my mind afire. She said that all of the cities she's worked in, Kirkwall was the most difficult, and that the city is almost literally a maze. Recollecting my first years in Kirkwall, I have to agree. Getting lost was commonplace. The city was a sprawling mess. The mason showed me a plan of the city, and my heart skipped a beat. There were patterns in the intersections, back alleys and boulevards. Some magisters believed in the power of symbols and shapes. In the oldest parts of the city, one can make out the outlines of glyphs in the very streets. What manner of magic is this? Underneath a cobblestone with curious markings and sun, the band of three. Ironically, the Chantry has the best records on the Imperium occupation that we've found. None of the forbidden texts, which have undoubtedly been destroyed, but many administrative records. In their cold, numbered rows, misery is told. Thousands of slaves passed through the gallows to work the mines or to be shipped elsewhere. The list of elven children is nubbing. Three maimed, two mute, and four serviceable. These numbers don't add up. For every thousand slaves that came to Kirkwall, a hundred disappeared. I checked the tax rolls as well, and the discrepancy exists there too. If one has the wit to see it, 203 slaves went missing in the Imperium's 312th year. That's just one year. 
Other records show similar discrepancies. Over centuries, practically a whole civilization of slaves simply disappeared. Hidden inside the cover of a book with curious markings and signed, The Band of Three. After pursuing another dead end, we were attacked by Maleficarum. I fear V will not make it. The fences must have dipped them off. Are they? Are the cultists trying to protect the answer? Are they after it themselves, or was it a random attack? The mages of Kirkwall have a more troubled history than those in other circles. A greater percentage of them do not survive the harrowing, and a greater percentage turn to blood magic. Almost double that of Starkhaven or Oswick. Is there a secret fraternity delving into the Tevinter secrets of the city? Either way, we must be more careful, lest we become the band of one. Or none. Hidden under a cobblestone with curious markings and signed, the band of three. Access has not been easy, and I fear my disguise will not bear great scrutiny. But I saw the records the Templars say do not exist. The blood of countless slaves was spilled beneath the city in sacrifice. Whole buildings were built upon lakes of blood. The sewers have grooves where blood would flow and leading down. The scale is hard to fathom. A blood mage can channel great power from a simple cut. At least a thousand unfortunates died here every year for centuries. For what ungodly purpose would one need so much power? I must retreat now before I am uncovered. But the answer is close. Behind a panel with curious markings and sign, the band of three. It is well known that the veil is thin in Kirkwall, small wonder given the suffering in the city. But we've discovered the magisters were deliberately thinning it even further. Beneath the city, demons can contact even normal men. Did they seek the black city to compound the madness of their previous efforts, or was it something else? We found the chamber where the veil is in its thinnest, long since looted, but the power is still here. Tonight we will go there. Pray for us. Pray for us all. Hidden behind a rock with curious markings and signed, the band of three. A recent trove was uncovered. This one was big, perhaps the Archon's visitation chambers. And a flood of tombs is on the market. Even the simple fences know something is amiss. They've raised their prices at the frenzy of collectors. One said he sold a copy of the Fall Grimoire. I doubt he would lie. How could he know that Tome is a mere legend? If that is real, then what of the forgotten ones? This journey has taken us to many strange places and made us reevaluate many former truths. Where will it end? Hidden under a cobblestone with curious markings and signed, the band of three. We went to the center of it all. F is dead and I am alone and injured. I must go back and put an end to it. The maddening thing is there is still no answer. But the forgotten one, or demon, or whatever it is, must be destroyed. I fear one may already be unbound. I forswear my oaths. The magister's lore must be burned and the ashes scattered. No good can come out of it. And make her help us if someone does answer what we could not. Hidden near curious markings and sign. The Band of Free. The Fade. The study of the Fade is as old as humankind. For so long as men have dreamed, we have walked its twisting paths, sometimes catching a glimpse of the city at its heart, always as close as our own thoughts, but impossibly separated from our world. The Tevinter Imperium once spent vast fortunes of gold, lyrium, and human slaves in an effort to map the terrain of the Fade, an ultimately futile endeavor. Although portions of it belong to powerful spirits, all of the fate is in constant flux. The Imperium succeeded in it finding the desperate and ever-shifting realms of a dozen demon lords, as well as cataloging a few hundred types of spirits, before they were forced to abandon the project. The relationship of dreamers to the fate is complex. Even when entering the fate for the use of lyrium, mortals are not able to control or affect it. The spirits who dwell there, however, can, and, as the Chantry teaches us, the great flaw of the spirits is that they have neither imagination nor ambition. 
They create what they see through their sleeping visitors, building elaborate copies of our cities, people and events, which, like the reflections in a mirror, ultimately lack context or life of their own. Even the most powerful demons merely plagiarize the worst thoughts and fears of mortals, and build their realms with no other ambition than to taste life. From Tranquility and the Role of the Fade in Human Culture By First Enchanter Josephus Falandaris The name Falandaris is Elvan, meaning demon weed, which is fitting for this rare plant because it grows only in places where the veil is thin. Falandaris is easily undatified. It's a twisted, wicked-looking shrub with long, thorny shoots and no leaves, a skeletal hand reaching out from an unmarked grave. Many swear the plant radiates a palpable aura of malevolence, so it comes to no surprise that it unnerves many a junior herbalist. An excerpt from the Botanical Compendium by Ennis Arencia, botanist. Forbidden Knowledge Tarone's Book of Blood Was Dabun Haid one mage, or a full cabal? I found another reference to Zenbeck in his Black Journal. The blood feeds, the blood nourishes. In blood, the call is heard. In blood, the deal is made. My master bathed in a river of blood. Then the great Zabanan came. Tarone's Beginning In 4-2 Black is the oldest account of the Forbidden Ones, though most mages consider them a hoax. But someone had to make the first deal, that first contact with the other side from the unknown mage's account. The first of the magus cast themselves deep into the fade in search of answers and power, always power. They found the forbidden ones. Zebenkek, Imshael, Gagsgang the Unbound, and the formless one. Many conversations were had and much of the fabric of the world revealed. And thus the magic of blood was born. Even those who consider this folly dare not utter these names. Tyrone's Lessons Everything you learned was a lie. Andraste was a deluded fool. The Maker is a hoax. There is far more evidence of the Forbidden Ones and Demons that has been gathered over a thousand years of Aphexia's God. Demons are not enemies. They are tools to be used. Extract what secrets you can and teach others. Some of us will die, some will be corrupted. But each victory is another piece of the truth we uncover. Tyrone's Beginnings, the second. Inside the Grimoire's pages were such secrets. A mage's rightful place is not under the heel of the Templars. We are masters of the elements. We call forth the spirits themselves. As far as we have advanced, the ancient of Intermages knew so much more, and even they were only starting their journey to understand the nature of our world. We were never meant to walk among mortal men. We were meant to command them. Tyrone's Prophecies The fell Grimora holds the names of power. It holds the key to their summoning. Zebenkek will return. He will feast on the blood of a thousand of my enemies. It is inevitable. Excerpt from the last letters to Tyrone. I have copied the Grimora and hidden it. It must live on. It is the signpost of the path and the path never dies. I have set guardians along it, but you must overcome them. Read the signs, my brothers and sisters, for even if my enemies destroy me, together we cannot fail. There are secrets undreamt of deep in the fade. Therein lies our destiny, our salvation. The Founding of the Chantry Cordelius Draken, king of the city-state of Orlais, was a man of uncommon ambition. In the year minus fifteen ancient, the young king began construction of a great temple dedicated to the Maker, and declared that by its completion he would not only have united the warring city-states of the south, he would have brought Andrastian belief to the world. In minus three ancient, the temple was completed. There, in its heart, Draken knelt before the eternal flame of Andraste and was crowned ruler of the Empire of Orlay. His first act as emperor? To declare the Chantry as the established Andrastian religion of the Empire. 
It took three years and several hundred votes before Alessa of Montsimard was elected to lead the new chantry. Upon her coronation as divine, she took the name Justinia, in honor of the disciple who recorded Andraste's songs. In the moment, the ancient era ended and the divine age began. From Ferelden, Folklore and History by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. Glitter Dust Glitter Dust is the powdered form of a rock found along the wounded coast. When explorers brought the sparkling rock to the markets of the pre marches, it became immediately popular among wealthy ladies who crushed it and applied the powder to their faces. The added brightness and luster to their skin, however, soon paled in comparison to developing rash and coughing fits. As it turned out, glitter dust is dangerous if ingested or inhaled. It's also extremely flammable, as several ladies discovered after powdering their hair while standing next to a candle. Unfortunately, this resorted in a dozen deaths by conflagration. These days, glitter dust is used sparingly and only by experienced alchemists. The co most common form of the substance is volatile glitter dust. If gathered from caves where darkspawn dwell, the rock produces a powder known as tainted glitter dust. As an excerpt from the Alchemist Encyclopedia by Lord Sorastus of Marna Spell. The Grey Wardens. The first blight had already raged for ninety years. The world was in chaos. A god has risen, twisted and corrupted. The remaining gods of the winter were silent, withdrawn. What writing we have recovered from those times is filled with despair, from everyone believed, from the greatest archons to the lowliest slaves, that the world was coming to an end. At Weishaupt Fortress, in the desolate Underfels, a meeting transpired. Soldiers of the Imperium, seasoned veterans who had known nothing in their entire lifetimes except hopeless war, came together. When they left Weishaupt, they had renounced their oaths to the Imperium. They were soldiers no longer. They were the Grey Wardens. The Wardens began an aggressive campaign against the Blight, striking back against the Darkspawn, reclaiming lands given up for lost. The Blight was far from over, but their victories brought notice, and soon they received aid from every notion and fadus. They grew in number as well as reputation. Finally, in the year 1992 of the Tevinter Imperium, Upon the silent plains, they met the archdemon Dumas in battle. A third of all the armies of northern Thedas were lost to the fighting, but Dumas fell and the darkspawn fled back underground. Even that was not the end. The Imperium once revered seven gods, Dumat, Zazikiel, Toth, Andoral, Razikal, Lusakan and Orthemio. Four have risen as archdemons. The Grey Wardens have kept watch through the ages, well aware that peace is fleeting, and that their war continues until the last of the Dragon Gods is gone. From Ferelden, Folklore and History by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. Hierarchy of the Circle It is no simple matter, safeguarding ordinary men from mages, and mages from themselves. Each circle tower must have some measure of self-government for it is ever the Maker's will that men be given the power to take responsibility for our own actions, to sin and fail, as well as to achieve the highest grace and glory on our own strength. You, who will be tasked with the protection of the circle, must be aware of its workings. The first enchanter is the heart of any tower. He will determine the course his circle will take. He will choose which apprentices may be tested and made full mages, and you will work most closely with him. Assisting the first enchanter will be the senior enchanters, a small council of the most trusted and experienced magi in the tower. From this group, the next first enchanter is always chosen. Beneath the council are the enchanters. These are the teachers and mentors of the tower, and you must get to know them in order to keep your finger on the poles of the circle for the enchanters will always know what is happening among the children. All those who have passed their harrowing but have not taken apprentices are mages. This is where the most trouble in a circle lies, in the idleness and experience of youth. The untested apprentices are the most numerous denizens of any tower, 
but they more often pose threats to themselves due to their lack of training than to anyone else. Knight Commander Seren of the Chantry Templars in a letter to his successor. History of Kirkwall, Chapter 1 It's difficult for many to comprehend today, but there was a time when Kirkwall was believed to be the very edge of the world. It was Emirius then, named after its founder Magister Emirius Cradion. It was but one outpost on the very fringe of the Tevinter Imperium. There the Magister serfs worked at the quarries for the jetstone needed for the mighty temples of Minrathus. After a slave rebellion nearly burned the temple to the ground in the great city, it was determined that a center for a slave trade would need to be established well away from the more civilized parts of the Imperium. Though account may be exaggerated, since the notorious Archon Vanarius Isar narrowly escaped assassination at the hands of an elven slave at the time. Because the new slave outpost would become wealthy beyond imagining, competition among prospects reportedly took over 20 years to resolve, resulting in great bloodshed for the frontier, well away from the Archon's eyes. Magister took arms against Magister, mostly in the form of small armies of serfs and mercenaries. Over half the slaves in existence allegedly died in these battles before Emirius was finally chosen, thanks to the marriage of Craven's son to the Archon's daughter. Within a mere decade, the mighty fortress was erected on the cliff where Kirkwall now stands. Over one million slaves passed through its gates before the Imperium eventually fell, an unmanageable number by today's standards. The Craven family itself became patrons of the next three Archons, and was one of the driving forces behind the extension of the Imperial Highway into the Ferelden Valley, a move that would cost them considerable political influence after the resistance of the Alamari tribes. During its height, Emirius was a jewel to rival the mightiest of the Imperial cities and the greatest center of civilization outside Paventer. Chapter 2 as the Imperium's borders slowly receded after the devastation of the First Blight and the subsequently barbarian invasion, many outposts in the area known today as the Free Marches were cut off from centers of power. Numerous warlords tried consolidating the region into a single kingdom, but resistance prevailed. Emirius held out for almost a century until it fell to a slave revolt in 25 Ancient. It was not the first such revolt Emirius suffered, but it was the last. It started when an Alamari slave named Radun began earning popularity and power by pushing for better conditions. Radun's growing influence prevented the magisters from touching him, but eventually they had him poisoned. Furious, a group of Radun supporters stormed the gallows and were massacred, and so began a year-long bloody rebellion. The city burned and wealthy high town was sacked. The magisters hung before cheering crowds. Emirius assumed the new name of Kirkwall, Kirk meaning black, after his just stone cliffs. The new city plunged into anarchy for over a decade, and its defenses fell into ruin. Kirkwall has been conquered many times since, the city's own independence suffering since the freeing of its slaves. Chapter 3 the Kinari first thundered in Kirkwall and 756 stormed during last of the new exalted marches. The collected nations of Tedas were attempting to drive the Kinari from the northern mainland once and for all. Kinari armies were on the retreat, but in a desperate gamble, their fleet circled around the Amaranthine coast and landed a great force near the marcher city of Ostwick. Their plan was to overwhelm the marcher cities of Starkhaven and Kirkwall, Starkhaven to block the roads leading north, and Kirkwall to block ships on the Waking Sea coming from Orlay. All in an effort to deny supplies to the Thedas armies assaulting Ruvain. The attack on Starkhaven eventually failed, but Kirkwall was attacked in a daring night raid where the Cunari used their leashed Sarabas mages in an unprecedented display of sorcery. Their walls were torn down and the city was taken and for the next four years, Kirkwall endured the most brutal occupation in its history. Writings from that time are scarce. It was not until after the city was freed that the Cunari's deeds came to light. Children taken from families, forced conversion to the Cunari religion, 
and brutal labor camps. It's ironic that the old slave quarters of Lowtown, still intact after centuries, provided the perfect means for the Cunari to control the city's people. When the famous Orlesian Chevalier, Sir Michel Lafayette, rode into the city after finally defeating the, the Cunari defenders, he wrote, Kirkwall is full of people with empty eyes that have had all independent thought driven from them. When Lafayette was appointed the city's first viscount by the emperor in 760 storm, he made it his mission to undo the religious counts machining. The Lafayette bloodline remained popular enough that when the city finally rebelled against Orlesian rule in 8-5 blessed, Viscount remained the enduring title for Kirkwall's rulers despite its origin. Chapter 4 The Fernhold family assumed its foreboding control of the city at the very onset of the Dragon Age, less than a week after Marek Theron retook the Ferelden throne from Orlais. Since this was followed by a civil war in Antiva, the much maligned Free Queen's era, and a coup in the Deventer Imperium, many thought the Dragon Age would bring devastating change. Perhaps this was a hasty estimate, but it was true for Kirkwall. Viscount Chivalry Thernhold was a vicious thug who took power for a campaign of intimidation, and his son Perrin, who succeeded him in 1914 Dragon Age, was even worse. Taxes were crippling, and Perrin Thernhold used the ancient chains extending from the twins. Standing at Kirkwall's Harbour Unused since the new exalted marches, to block sea traffic and charge exorbitant fees from Eurasian ships. The Empire threatened invasion following the closure of the Waking Sea Passage, and for the first time the Chandri used the Templars to pressure the Viscount. Until that point, the Templars had done nothing to counter the Frenholz, even though, as the largest armed force in Kirkwall, they could have. Knight Commander Gaelian's only written comment was in a letter to Divine Beatrix III. It is not our place to interfere in political affairs. We are here to safeguard the city against magic, not against itself. The Divine, as a friend to the Emperor, clearly had other ideas. In response, Viscount Perrin hired a mercenary army, forcing a showdown with the Templars. They stormed the gallows and hung Knight Commander Gaelian igniting a series of battles that ended with Perrin's arrest and the last of his family's rule. The Templars were hailed as heroes, and even though they wished to remain out of Kirkwall's affairs, it was now forced upon them. Knight Commander Meredith appointed Lord Merlo Dumas as the new Viscount in 921 Dragon, and she has remained influential in the city's rule ever since. From Kirkwall, the City of Chains, by Brother Genetivi 924 Dragon The History of the Chantry Chapter 1 The Imperium in Flames The first blight devastated the Tevinter Imperium. Not only had the darkspawn ravaged the countryside, but Tevinter citizens had to face the fact that their own gods had turned against them. Dumat, the old god once known as the Dragon of Silence, had risen to silence the world and despite the frenzied pleas for help, the other old gods did nothing. The people of the Imperium began to question their faith, murdering priests and burning temples to punish their gods not for, for not returning to help. In those days, even after the devastation of the First Blight, the Imperium stretched across the known world. Fringed with barbarian tribes, the Imperium was well prepared for invasions and attacks from without. Fitting, then, that the story of its downfall begins from within. The people of the far northern and eastern reaches of the Imperium rose up against their powerful overlords in rebellion. The Tevinter Magisters summoned demons to put down these small rebellions, leaving corpses to burn as examples to all who would dare revolt. The Imperium began to tear itself apart from within, throngs of angry and disillusioned citizens doing what centuries of opposing armies could not. But the Magisters were confident in their power, and they could not imagine surviving a Blight only to destroy it by their own subjects. Even after the Blight, the Winter commanded an army larger than that of any other organized nation in Thedas, but that army was scattered and its morale dwindling. The ruin of the Winter was such that the Alamari barbarians, who had spread their clans and holds over the wilderness of the Ferolden Valley, 
at the far southeast edge of the Imperium, saw weakness in their enemy, and, after an age of oppression, embarked on a campaign not only to free their own lands, but to bring down mighty Tevinter as well. The leaders of that blessed campaign were not were the great barbarian warlord, Mar Matarat, and his wife, Andraste. Their dreams and ambitions would change the world forever. Chapter 2 A Prophet Born When the prophet Andraste and her husband, Matarat, arrived at the head of the barbarian horde, Southern Tevinter was thrown into chaos. The Imperium had defended against invasions in the past, but now they stood without the protection of their gods, with their army in tatters and their country devastated by the blight. Many felt that the timing of the invasion was yet another of the Maker's miracles in Andraste's campaign to spread his divine word. Andraste was more than simply the wife of a warlord, after all. She was also the beloved of the Maker. Enraptured by the melodic sound of her voice as she sang to the heavens for guidance, the Maker himself appeared to Andraste and proposed that she come with him, leaving behind the flawed world of humanity. In her wisdom, Andraste pleaded with the Maker to return to his people and create paradise in the world of men. The Maker agreed, but only if all of the world would turn away from the worship of false gods and accept the Maker's divine commandments. Armed with the knowledge of the one true God, Andraste began the exalted marches into the weakened Empyrean. One of the Maker's commandments, that magic should serve men rather than rule over him, was as honey to the souls of the downtrodden of the winter who lived under the thumbs of the Magisters. Word of the Andraste's exalted march, of her miracles and military success, spread far and wide. Those in the Imperium who felt the old gods had abandoned them eagerly listened to the words of the Maker. Those throngs of restless citizens that destroyed temples now did so in the name of the Maker and his prophet Andraste. As Matara's armies conquered the lands of Southern Winter, so did Andraste's words conquer hearts. It is said that the Maker smiled on the world of the Battle of Valerian Fields in which the forces of Matharath challenged and defeated the greatest army the Venter could muster. The southern reaches of the mighty Imperium now lay at the mercy of barbarians. Faith and the Maker, bolstered by such miracles, threatened to shake the foundations of the Imperium apart. Of course, the human heart is more powerful than the greatest weapon, and when wounded, it is capable of the blackest of deeds. Chapter 3 on the betrayal of Andraste. It is said that at the Battle of Valerian Fields, Matharab stood and looked over his armies. He had conquered the southern reaches of the greatest empire the world had ever known, and built splintered barbarian clans into a force to be feared. With pride in his heart, he turned to congratulate his men and found that they had turned from him. Matharab fell to the evil of jealousy. After all that he had done, his wife was the one to receive all the glory. He saw his wife's power and influence, and tired of his place as second husband, below the Maker. His heart swelled with fury. If he had conquered just to have his wife wrest from him by a forgotten god and a legion of faith-hungry rubble, then perhaps this, was, this war was not worth the trouble. Here, history really and the chant of light come apart. History tells us that Matharaft looked north into the central Imperium and saw nothing but more war against a rapidly regrouping army, and he despaired. The Chant of Light holds that Matharaft chafed with jealousy of the Maker, and jealousy of the glory that Andraste received, although it was he who led the armies. Matharaft travelled to the Imperial city of Minratos to speak with the Archon Hasarian. There he offered up his wife to the Imperium and returned for a truce that would end hostilities once and for all. The Archon, eager to put down the voice of the prophet that stirred his own people against him, agreed. Matharaf led Andraste into an ambush, where she was captured by Imperial agents, putting an end to her exalted march. Crowds of loyalists stood in the central square of Nivratos to watch Andraste's execution. By command of the Archon, she was burned at the stake in what the Imperium believed to be the most painful punishment imaginable. According to the Chantry, however, 
Andraste was instead purified and made whole by the flames, ascending to life at the Maker's side. By all accounts, there was only silence where they expected screams. At the sight of the prophet burning, the crowds were filled with a profound guilt, as if they had participated in a great blasphemy. So moving was the moment that the Archon himself drew his sword and thrust it into the prophet's heart, ending her torment and leaving those assembled to consider the weight of what they had seen. Whereas the execution of Andraste was meant to be a symbol of defeat for the faith of the Maker, in truth it all but sealed the fate of the worship of the old gods and paved the way for the spread of the Maker's chant. Chapter 4 On the Birth of the Chantry The crowds present at the death of Andraste were right to feel despair. It is believed that the prophet's execution angered the Maker, and he turned his back on humanity once more, leaving the peoples of Thedas to suffer in the dark. In these dark times, mankind scrambled for a light, any light. Some found comfort in demonic cults that promised power and riches in return for worship. Others prayed to the old gods for forgiveness, begging the great dragons to return to the world. Still others fell so low as to worship the darkspawn, forming vile cults dedicated to the exaltation of evils in its purest form. It is said that the world wept as its people begged for a savior who would not come. Andraste's followers, however, did not abandon her teachings when she died. The cult of Andraste rescued her sacred ashes from the courtyard in Ninratus after her execution, stealing them away to a secret temple. The location of the temple has been long lost, but the ashes of Andraste served as a symbol of the fanjuring nature of the faith in the Maker, that humanity could earn the Maker's forgiveness despite its grievous insult to him. With time the cult of Andraste spread and grew, and the chant of light took form. Sing this chant in the four corners of Thedas, it was said, and the world would gain the Maker's attention at last. As the chant of light spread, the cult of Andraste became known as the Andrastian Chantry. Those who converted the Chantry's beliefs found in their mission to spread Andraste's word. There were many converts, including powerful people in the Imperium and in the city-states of what is now Orlay. Such was the power of the Maker's word that the young King Draken undertook a series of exalted marches meant to unite the city-states and create an empire solely dedicated to the Maker's will. The Orlesian Empire became the seat of a Chantry's power, the Grand Cathedral in Val Royal, the source of the movement that birthed the organized Chantry as we know it today. Draken, by then Emperor Draken I, created the Circle of Magi, the Order of Templars and the Holy Office of the Divine. Many within the Chantry revere him nearly as equal with Vetnaste herself. The modern chantry is a thing of faith and beauty, but it is also a house of necessity, protecting Thedas from powerful forces that would do it harm. Where the Grey Wardens protect the world from the blights, the chantry protects mankind from itself. Most of all, the chantry works to earn the Maker's forgiveness, so that one day he will return and transform the world into the paradise it was always meant to be. From Tales of the Destruction of Thedas by Brother Jindal TV, Chantry Scholar. History of the Circle It is a truth universally acknowledged that nothing is more successful in inspiring a person to mischief as being told not to do something. Unfortunately, the Chantry of the Divine Age had some trouble with obvious truths. Although it did not outlaw magic, quite the contrary, as the Chantry relied upon magic to kindle the eternal flame which burns in every brazier in every Chantry, it relegated mages to lighting candles and lamps, perhaps occasional busting of rafters and eaves. I will give my readers a moment to contemplate how well such a role satisfied the mages of the time. It surprised absolutely no one when the mages of Val Royale, in protest, snapped the sacred flames of the cathedral and barricaded themselves inside the choir loft. No one, that is but divine Ambrosia II, who was outraged and attempted to order an exalted march upon her own cathedral. Even her most devout Templars discouraged that idea. 
For 21 days, the fires remained unlit while negotiations were conducted, legend tells us, by shouting back and forth from the lot. The mages went cheerily into exile in a remote fortress outside of the Copero, where they could be kept under the watchful eye of the Templars and a council of their own elder magi. Outside of normal society and outside of the Chantry, the mages would form their own close society, the Circle separated for the first time in human history. From Of Fires, Circles and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry by Sister Petrine, Chantry Scholar. An honest answer regarding apostates. A mage who does not receive the teachings of the Circle and who does not have the words of Andraste in her heart is an apostate and a danger to us all. Without the guidance of the Holy Chantry, a mage may foolishly dabble in the darker arts, blood magic or demon summoning, thus becoming maleficarum, and a mage's mind will ever be a doorway to spirits of the paid. Without proper instruction, this doorway remains open and unsecured. If a demon should come through this doorway and possess a mage, an abomination is created. Abominations know only madness. They cannot be reasoned with and will slaughter men, woman and child without thought. Whole cities have fallen to these creatures. Thousands have died at their hands. If I knew a better way to deal with magic, I would seize upon it immediately. You say we should let the mages guard themselves. I tell you that this is no solution. Look at the Tivinter Imperium. Their magisters do not know restraint. Without chantry oversight, the magisters abuse their power. Those without magic are trampled under food and forced to serve. Slaves are slaughtered by the hundreds to feed the magisters' hunger for power. Even some mages are not spared, for in mages, as in all humans, there exists a spectrum. On one end, the very powerful, and on the other, those that can barely light a candle. The empire cares only for the strongest, and those who do not compare favorably are from to the wolves. Imagine your children growing up in such a world. If a mage asked it of you, you would have to give him your daughter, not knowing what his plans for her might be. You could not resist him, and neither could she. Without our Templars and without the Circle, the common man would have no defense against magic. We must deny the mages certain freedoms for the common good. I wish there was another way. I tell the apprentices this as a test of their faith that this is the will of the Maker. Many understand that we do what we do for their own good. Excerpt of a letter from Grand Cleric Francesca of Starkhaven to Lord Godfrey Abholtz. The Imperial Chantry. There are those who would tell you that the Chantry is the same everywhere as it is here. The Divine Eval Royal reigns supreme in the eyes of the Maker and this is fact and questions for Altairas. Do not believe it. The Maker's Second Commandment Magic must serve man, not rule over him. Never held the same meaning within the ancient Tivinter Imperium as it did elsewhere. The Chantry there interpreted the rule as meaning that mages should never control the minds of other men, and that otherwise their magic should benefit the rulers of men as much as possible. When the clerics of Tivinter altered the Chant of Light to reflect this interpretation of the commandment, the divine Val Royal ordered the clerics to revert to the original chant. They refused, claiming corruption within Val Rio, an argument that grew until in 487 Towers, the chantry in Tevinter elected its own legitimate and uncorrupted divine Valhael, who was not only male, but also happened to be one of the most prominent members of the Tevinter Circle of the Magi. This black divine was reviled outside Tevinter. His existence an offense to the chantry in Val Royale. After four exalted marches to dislodge these rebels, all that the chantry in Val Royale accomplished was to cement the separation. While most aspects of the chantry, imperial chantry's teaching are the same, prohibitions against magic have been weakened and male priests have become more prevalent. The circle of the Magi today rules the winter directly, ever since the Archon Nomoran was elected in 734 Storm directly from the ranks of the enchanters, to great applause from the public. He dispensed with the old rules forbidding mages from taking part in politics, 
and within a century the true rulers within the various imperial houses, the mages, took their places openly within the government. The imperial divine is now always drawn from the ranks of the first enchanters and operates as divine and grand enchanter both. This is utter heresy to any member of the chantry outside of Tevinter, a return to the days of the magisters, which brought the blight down upon us. But it exists, and even though we have left the Tevinter Imperium to the mercies of the Dread Kunari, still they have endured. Further confrontation between the Black Divine and our so-called White Divine is inevitable. From Edicts of the Black Divine by Father David Carinus, 811 Blessed. The Kirkwall City Guard. It is with pride that I, your Viscount, grant the authority of law and civil enforcement upon the guardsmen of the independent Kirkwall. No more will we defer to the will of foreign troops or draw a holy order into tasks unbefitting their mandate. These proud men and women will be the people and will enforce the laws we have elected for a civil and ordered society. And should the spectre of invasion return, the noble guardsmen will conscript from the population. For who better to amass the people's will than the constables of law charged with its inspection? This is a great day for Kirkwall, and I am honored to appoint the first guard captain. Long may he serve the will of a free people. From Orlesian Legacy, How Institutions of the Oppressors Linger, the speeches of Viscount Michel Lafayette. Collected by Philian, a bard. The Lomeran Accords. Fifty years. That's how long it took the Imperium to drive out the Cunari occupation. But the rest of the Northern Thedas was not so lucky. Both divines, white and black, declared exalted marches, and for the only time since the schism of the Chantry, they worked together. A century-long siege resulted, with the giant Cunari entrenched in Antiva and Ravane, and all of Theda's throwing armies against them. The war drained the resources of every nation in Theda's, leaving most of them on the brink of collapse. For the giants, it did not appear to be the damage to their armada or the loss of their soldiers, but the terrible toll upon the Ravani population that prompted their retreat. When the third new exalted march had all but massacred the people of Comtar, without even chipping the Cunari occupying force, the giants finally withdrew. The treaty that put an official end to the Cunari Wars was signed on a politically neutral island of Lomerin, off the southern coast of Rivain. One hundred and fifty years after the assault on the mine line began, the Cunari left our shores. They received the northern archipelago in exchange for secession of hostilities against all the nations on the Accord. Only Tevinter refused to sign, and so the war continues to rage in the Imperium to the present day. It's worth noting, however, that the Kingdom of Ravain immediately violated the treaty, twice. Once, when the humans of Northern Ravain, nearly all practitioners of the Kuhn and therefore by definition Cunari, refused to leave their homes and go in exile to the islands. And again, when the Ravain Chantry and Nationalist forces, unable to convert its people back to the worship of the Maker, tried to purge by the sword, slaughtering countless unarmed people and burying them in mass graves. It's a fortunate mystery that the leaders of Kontar did not alert their allies in the Northern Passage, or we'd still be fighting the giants now. From the Exalted Marches, an examination of Chantry warfare by Sister Petrine, Chantry Scholar. Lyrium. Lyrium is the king of metals. Beneath our feet, it sinks. When properly refined, it is a smooth, slightly iridescent, silvery liquid. In the hands of the dwarven smith cast, it is mixed with steel to produce indestructible armor and blades that hold an edge for centuries. In the hands of the shaperet, it becomes a repository for living memories and some scholars maintain this as evidence that lyrium is, itself, alive. It finds its most lucrative its application in the hands of the formari, who use it conjunctions with baser metals like gold, silverite, beridium, or even iron, to produce enchantments, though mages, of course, consume it in a diluted form to bolster their abilities, this is not recommended 
overindulgence in lyrium can have disastrous consequences, particularly in more concentrated amounts. It is not advisable, for instance, that any reader handle raw lyrium, which in many cases can kill on contact. An excerpt from an alchemical primer of metallurgy, volume 1, by Lord Serestus of Marnaspell. The Mage Underground To Knight Commander Meredith, read the so-called Mage Underground. Every circle in Theta suffers from individual mages who rebel and attempt to flee. These apostates are usually found and returned to the circle or mercifully killed if they have fallen to demonic temptation. Until now, I have never served anywhere that the populace does not fully cooperate in hunting those rebels. Here in Kirkwall, citizens actually help rebel mages escape. Escaped apostates have survived their freedom long enough to form this mage un underground, a network that feeds and shelters escapees and even transports apostates into remote areas of the free marches and beyond our easy reach. As of late, the movement has grown bolder, sending raiding parties into the gallows in an attempt to break out the mages who lack the skills or willpower to escape on their own. This is a grave concern. My recommendation is to fight back, both physically and in turning the minds and hearts of their supporters against them. The Maker There was no word for heaven or for earth, for sea or sky. All that existed was silence. Then the voice of the Maker rang out, the first word, and his word became all that I might be, dream and idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities. And from it made his firstborn, and he said to them, In my image I forge you, to you I give you dominion over all that exists, by your will may all things be done. Then in the center of heaven he called forth, a city with towers of gold, streets with music for cobblestones, and banners which flew without wind. There he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. The children of the Maker gathered before his golden throne, and sang hymns of praise unending, but their songs were the songs of the cobblestones. They shone with the golden light reflected from the Maker's throne. They held forth the banners that flew on their own. And the voice of the Maker shook the fate, saying, In my image I have wrought my firstborn. You have been given dominion over all that exists. By your will all things are done, yet you do nothing. The realm I have given you is formless, ever-changing. And he knew that he had wrought amiss. So the Maker turned from his firstborn and took from the fate a measure of its living flesh, and placed it apart from the spirits, and spoke to it, saying, Here I decree opposition in all things, for earth, sky, for winter, summer, for darkness, light, by my will alone is balance sundered and the world given new life. And no longer was it formless, ever-changing, but held fast, immutable, with wars for heaven and for earth, sea and sky, at last did the Maker from the living world make man, immutable as the substance of the earth, with souls made of dream and idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities. Then the Maker said, To you, my second-born, I grant this gift. In your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame, all-consuming and never satisfied. From the fade I crafted you, and to the fade you shall return, each night in dreams, that you may always remember me. And then the Maker sealed the gates of the Golden City, and there he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. Frenolis, 1-8 to eight. The Maker's First Children The Maker's first creations were the spirits, glorious beings that populated the many spires of the Golden City, and the Chant of Light says that they were revered by the Maker with a questioning devotion. The Maker, however, was dissatisfied, although the spirits were like him in the way that they could manipulate the ether and create from it, 
they did not do so. They had no urge to create, and even when instructed to do so, possessed no imagination to give their creation ingenuity of life. The maker realized his own folly. He had created the spirits to resemble him in all but the one and most important way. They did not have the spark of the divine within them. He expelled other spirits out of the golden city and into the fade and proceeded to its next creation. Life. The maker created the world and the living things upon it, separated from the fade by the veil. His new children would be unable to shape the world around them, and thus they would need to struggle to survive. In return for their struggle, the Maker gave them the spark of the Divine, a soul, and he watched with pleasure as his creations flourished and showed all the ingenuity that he had hoped for. The spirits grew jealous of the living and coasted from them into the fade when they slept. The spirits wished to know more of life, hoping to find a way to regain the Maker's favor. Through the eyes of the living, they experienced new concepts, love, fear, pain, and hope. The spirits reshaped the fate and to resemble the lives and concepts they saw, each spirit desperately trying to bring the most dreamers to their own realms, so they could vicariously possess a spark of the divine through them. As the spirits grew in power, however, some of them became contemptuous of the living. These were the spirits that saw the darkest parts of the dreamers. Their lands were places of torment and horror, and they knew that the living were strongly drawn to places that mirrored those dark parts of themselves. These spirits questioned the Maker's wisdom and proclaimed the living inferior. They learned from the darkness they saw and became the first demons. Rage, hunger, sloth, desire, pride, these are the dark parts of the soul that give demons their power the hooks they used to claw their way into the world of the living. It was demons that whispered into the minds of men, convincing them to turn from the Maker and worship false gods. They seek to possess all life as their due, forging kingdoms of nightmare in the fate in the hopes of one day storming the walls of heaven itself. And the Maker despaired once again, for he had given the power of creation to his new children, and in return, they had created sin. From the Maker's First Children by Bader, Senior Enchanter of Ostwick, 812 Blessed. The Commandments of the Maker These truths the Maker has revealed to me. As there is but one world, one life, one death, there is but one God, and He is our Maker. They are sinners who have given their love to the false gods. Magic exists to serve man and never to rule over him. Foul and corrupt are they who have taken his gift and turned it against his children. They shall be named Maleficar, accursed ones. They shall be find no rest in this world or beyond. All men are the work of our Maker's hands, from the lowest slaves to the highest kings. Those who bring harm without provocation to the least of his children are hated and accursed by the Maker. Those who bear false witness and work to deceive others know this. There is but one truth. All things are known to our Maker, and he shall judge their lies. All things in this world are finite. What one man gains, another has lost. Those who steal from their brothers and sisters do harm to their livelihood, and to their peace of mind. Our Maker sees this with a heavy heart. Transfiguration 1, 1 to 5. Maleficarum. It has been asked, what are Maleficarum? How shall we know them? I have been asked this by this question as you. You have come to me for the wisdom of the Maker, but none have seen the Maker's heart save beloved Andraste. And so I have done as all mortals must and looked to the worlds of his prophet for answers. And there I found respite from a troubled mind. For she has said to us, Magic exists to serve man and never to rule over him. Therefore I say to you, they who work magic which dominates the minds and hearts of others, they have transgressed the Maker's law. Also, our lady said to us, 
Those who bring harm without provocation to the least of his children are hated and accursed by the Maker. And so it is made clear to me, as it should to be us all, that magic which fuels itself by harming others, by the letting of blood, is hated by the Maker. Those mages who honor the Maker and keep his laws we welcome as our brothers and sisters. Those who reject the laws of the Maker and the words of his prophet are apostate. They shall be cast out and given no place among us. From the Sermons of Justinia I. Mana and the Use of Magic Mana is that which defines a mage. It is potential that dwells within a person but does not always manifest itself. All men are connected to the Fade. We go there to dream, but only those with this potential may draw upon its power. Mana is, then, a measurement of one's ability to draw power from the paid, and it is the power that it is expended in magic. As in all other things, it has limits. Just as a man has the strength to lift only so much weight and no more, a mage cannot work magic at one time than his mana allows. If he wishes to work magic that would be beyond his strength, a mage must bolster his mana with lyrium. Without lyrium, it is possible for the reckless to expend their own life force in the working of magic, and occasionally ambitious apprentices endure or even kill themselves by overexertion. From the lectures of First Enchanter Wenceslas. Auricalcum. Like lyrium, auricalcum is a metal most commonly encountered in liquid form. Unlike lyrium, however, auricalcum forms pools and must be drawn like water rather than mined. Deep orichalcum is the most common type of the metal, and it is often found in places where opals are mined. The rare crystalline orichalcum is found in small pools in the mountains. Folk wisdom says that a drop of orichalcum mixed with wine is potent aphrodisiac, though it has a pungent smell similar to lye, so I could not bring myself to put this legend to the test. An excerpt from An Alchemical Primer of Metallurgy, Volume 1, by Lord Carastus of Marnaspel. The Kyun Long ago, the Ashkari lived in a great city by the sea. Wealth and prosperity shone upon the city like sunlight, and still its people grumbled in discontent. The Ashkari walked the streets of his home and saw that all around him were the signs of genius. Triumphs of architecture, artistic masterpieces, the palaces of wealthy merchants, libraries and concert halls. But he also saw signs of misery, the poor, sick, lost, frightened, and the hopeless. And the Ashkari asked himself, how can one people be both wise and ignorant, great and ruined, triumphant and despairing? So the Ashkari left the land of his birth, seeking out other cities and nations, looking for a people who had found wisdom enough to end hopelessness and despair. He wandered for many years through empires filled with palaces and gardens, but in every nation of the wise, the great and the mighty, he found the forgotten, the abandoned and the poor. Finally, he came to a vast desert, a wasteland of bare rock glowing at an empty spy, where he took shelter in the shadow of a towering rock and resolved to meditate until he found his answer or perished. Many days passed until one night, as he gazed out from the shadow of the rocks, he saw the lifeless desert awaken. A hundred thousand locusts hatched from the barren ground, and as one, they turned south, a single wave of moving earth. The Ashkari rose and followed in their wake, a path of devastation miles wide, the once verdant land turned to waste, and the Ashkari's eyes were opened. Existence is a choice. There is no chaos in the world, only complexity. Knowledge of the complex is wisdom. From wisdom of the world comes wisdom of the self. Mastery of the self is mastery of the world. Loss of the self is the source of suffering. Suffering is a choice, and we can refuse it. It is in our own power to create the world or destroy it. And the Ashkari went forth to his people, an excerpt from the Kyun, Canto 1. The Kunari 
The people of the Kuhn are, perhaps, the least understood group of Thetas. The Kunari wars were brutal, but so was the Chantry schism. So was the fallen of the Imperium. Some of this misunderstanding is an accident of nature. The race we call Kunari are formidable. Nature has given them fierce horns and strange eyes, and the ignorant look on them and sea monsters. Some, of, some is an accident of language. Few among the Kuhn's people speak the common tongue, and fewer speak it well. In a culture that strives for mastery, to have only a possible degree of skill is humiliating indeed, and so they often keep quiet amongst foreigners, out of shame. But much of it is a result of the culture itself. The Kunari view their whole society as a single creature, a living entity whose health and well-being is at the responsibility of all. Each individual is not only a tiny part of the whole, a drop of blood in its veins, important not for itself, but for what it is to the whole creature. Because of this, the Kunari most outsiders meet belong to the army, which the Kun regards as if it were the physical body. Arms, legs, eyes and ears, the things a creature needs in order to interact with the world. One cannot get to know a person solely by studying his hand or his food, so one cannot truly meet the Kunari until one has visited their cities. This is where their mind and soul dwell. In Saharon and Parvolan, only one can truly see the Kunari in their entirety. There, the unification of the Kunari into a single being is most evident. Workers, whom the Kun calls the mind, produce everything their Kunari require. The soul, the priesthood, seeks a greater understanding of the self, the world, and exhorts the body and mind to continually strive for perfection. The body serves as the go-between the, for the mind, the soul, and the world. Everyone and everything has a place, divided by the Kuhn, in which they work for the good of the whole. It is a life of certainty, of equality, if not individuality. From the writings of the Seer of Kontar, 841 plus. The Kunari, Asit Taleb When the Ashkari looked upon the destruction wrought by locusts, he saw at last the war order in the world. A plague must cause suffering for as long as it endures. Earthquakes must shatter the land. They are bound by their being. Asit Taleb, it is to be. For the world and the self are one. Existence is a choice. A self of suffering brings only suffering to the world. It is a choice, and we can refuse it. An excerpt from the Kyun, Canto 4. The Kunari, Sarabas. The Kyun teaches that all living things have a place and purpose, and only when they are in the correct place and in control of the self may they attain balance. When balance is lost, suffering follows. Mastery of the self is, therefore, the first and greatest duty. Those born with magic are at a terrible disadvantage, for demons can always rob them of their earth self. Because of this, the Kunari name them Sarabas, meaning dangerous thing, and treat them with the utmost caution. Sarabas must be carefully controlled by someone else, an Arbarad, one who holds back evil, because they cannot truly control themselves. The evil is not the mage, but the loss of the mage, the loss of the mage's self, and the suffering that inevitably follows. The Kunari pity and honor the Sarabas, for striving while under constant threat from within is truly selfless, which is the highest virtue of the Kun. From the writings of the seer of Kontar, 841 Blessed. The Raiders of the Waking Sea the Raiders of the Waking Sea, or simply the Raiders, is the common name given to an association of Antiguan pirates called the Velocissima Armada. These pirates were once little more than opportunists. Based out of the coastal city of Lomarin, they preyed on sea traffic. They were often targeted by religion and free marches cities that were bent on destroying the pirates once and for all. After each such effort, new pirates would appear to fill the vacuum. During the new exalted marches, the nations of Thedas needed every ship they could muster against the massive power of the Cunarian dreadnoughts. The Lomeran pirates were faced with a difficult decision. 
They had to band together under one flag and fight the, with those they had previously preyed upon, or face conversion and annihilation by the Cunari. Thus the armada was formed. The pirates brought their knowledge of stealth and trickery to bear, plaguing Cunari supply lines and even launching seaborne invasions against the Cunari coast. For a time it was said the armada was the premier naval power of Thedas, and after the signing of the Lomarin Accord, they maintained their association rather than disband as many had hoped. Wealthy merchants now often pay the leaders of the armada rather than risking their ships commandeered and their merchandise stolen and sold on the black market. The armada is hardly unified, and bloody battles between armada leaders are frequent, but when faced with an attack by outsiders, the group instantly puts aside their differences and closes ranks. The raiders have thus become far more of a threat in the last century than they were ever before. There is many a legend told about how dashing and romantic life aboard a rider vessel is, but don't believe it. They are scoundrels and smugglers all. From the The Wager's Field Guide to Good Society by Lady Alkine The Right of Annulment In the 83rd year of the Glory Age, one of the mages of the Enivaran Circle was found practicing forbidden magic. The Templars executed him swiftly, but his brood discontent among the Navara Circle. The mages mounted several magical attacks against the Empire, against the Templars, vengeance for the executed mage, but the Knight Commander was unable to track down which were responsible. Three months later, the mages summoned a demon and turned it loose against their Templar watchers. Demons, however, are not easily controlled. After killing the first wave of Templars who tried to contain it, the demon took possession of one of its summoners. The resulting abomination slaughtered Templars and mages both before escaping into the countryside. The Grand Cleric sent a legion of Templars to hunt the fugitive. They healed the abomination a year later, but by that time it had slain 70 people. Divine Galatea Responding to the catastrophe in Navarra and hoping to prevent further incidents, granted all the grand clerics of the Chantry the power to purge a circle entirely if they rule it in the irredeemable. The rite of annulment has been performed 17 times in the 7400 years. From Of Fires, Circles and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. The Seekers of Truth Sir Widmore, when I mentioned powers greater than the Templars, I didn't mean the Chantry. Sure, they command the Templars, but that was not always so. The Inquisition once hunted heretics and cultists as well as mages, and their reign of terror ended only with the inception of the Circle of Magi. They became the Templar Order, for good or ill the watchers of the mages and the martial arm of the Camp Chantry. It was a mutually beneficial arrangement, but few knew that the Chantry created yet another order to wash over the Templars, the Seekers of Truth. I know little of them, myself, but I can say the following things with certainty. They serve the Divine, and they are feared. When a Seeker steps from the shadows, Templars run for cover, because why would he come unless the Templars somehow fail in their duties? Seekers are extremely effective investigating abuses within the circle and hunting particularly evasive apostates. It's said that they are immune to a blood mage's mind control and possess the ability to read minds or erase memories, but this is likely exaggeration. So we return to my original dilemma. Who watches powers greater than that of the Templars? One assumes it's the Divine, but how much could she know about the activities when their very existence is a mystery to most? A letter from an unknown priest found in the Grand Cathedral Archives, 880 Blessed. The Sermons of Divine Renata I The weakness of mortal will is the great failing of all the Maker's children. We trade our honor as it is for it were the cheapest of currency. We do not understand what integrity is or what it is truly worth. From this ignorance, original sin was born. At some time, each of us has thought, what does it matter if I keep hold of my integrity? I am but one mortal. I am powerless. How blind we all are. The virtue of a single slave destroyed the Tevinter Imperium. The dishonor of one man drove the Maker from our sight. I tell you truly, nothing but the integrity of our hearts will win the love of the Maker back to us. 
It is all the power we shall ever possess to change this world for good or ill. From a Sermon on Integrity Silverite The lustrous white blue silverite has long been prized by the dwarves for use in jewelry, rune making and weaponsmithing, but on the surface it is more commonly used by apothecaries and healers. Since the metal does not rust, many traditions believe it to be proof against poison. There is a tale passed down among the people of the Underfells. A knight returned home after many years of war, only to be struck by an adder. His wife immediately bound the wound with a medallion of silverite pressed against the bite like a poultice. By morning the poison had left him, and the knight lived to an old age, an excerpt from an alchemical primer of metallurgy, volume 1, by Lord Carastus of Marnaspell. Slavery in the Tevinter Imperium Slavery still thrives in Thetas, even if the trade has been outlawed. Who hasn't heard the tales of poverty-stricken elves lured into ships by the prospect of whale-paying jobs in Antiva, only to find themselves clapped in like iron swans at sea? And humans fall prey to this, too. If they're lucky, they end up in Orlais, which has only servants. Most nobles treat them decently because they are afraid of admitting the truth. Religions go to great lengths to maintain the fiction that slavery is illegal. Of course, the greatest consumer of slave labor is the Tevinter Imperium, which would surely crumble if it not for the endless supply of slaves from all over the continent. There they are meat, chattel. They are beaten, used as fodder in the endless war against the Canari, and even serve as components in dark magic rituals. From Black City, Black Divine. A Study of the Tevinter Imperium by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. Spindleweed It is an old country saying that spindleweed grows best from the sower pool. Verdant spindleweed is in its household's garden, has often brought neighbors offering consolation, usually without even asking what might be wrong. This originates from the plants used as a seasoning for dishes meant to speed the recovery of the infirm. A person who grows much of it is likely caring for the fatally ill. An excerpt from the Botanical Compendium by Ines Arencia, Botanist. A Study of the Fifth Blight, Volume 1 While some of my contemporaries dispute whether the Fifth Blight was a true blight or merely our large dark spawn resurgence, historians agree that it began in the swamps of the Korkari Wilds on the southeast border of Ferelden in the year 930 Dragon. King Caelan Theron was swift in responding to the threat, gathering the royal army, every grey warden in his country, and sending a call for aid to the Ferelden nobility. The assembled armies laid a trap in the ruins of Ostagar, hoping to crush the force before it reached its civilization. But they failed. Darkspawn overran the defenders of Ostagar and decimated the king and his army. They continued their advance into Ferelden unopposed. Only two Grey Wardens managed to escape the slaughter, and somehow they came into possession of ancient treaties which compelled the races of men to join against the passing horde. Broken Circle, if the mages were recruited. The surviving Wardens made their way to Kinlock Hold, home of the Ferelden Circle, and constricted the mages, if the Templars were recruited. The surviving wardens made their way to Kinlock Hold and assisted in annulling the Ferelden Circle of Magi, which had fallen to abominations. With the end of the tragic disaster, the wardens constricted the Templars. Nature of the beast if the Dalish elves were recruited. In desperations to find more allies, the wardens journeyed into the Brazilian forest, seeking the Dalish. The elves too joined the growing army, if the werewolves were recruited. In desperation to find more allies, the Wardens journeyed into the Brazilian forest, seeking the Dalish. The elves failed to uphold the treaty, but another answered in their place. Werewolves, straight out of Ferelden folk tales, joined the growing army. Supported Paragon and the fate of the Anvil of the Void If the Anvil of the Void is destroyed. Into the deep roads the surviving Wardens went searching for Paragon Branca in hopes she could settle the unrest in Orzammar and unite the dwarves in the battle against the Archdemon. Branca could not be located, but another Paragon was found, the legendary Caridon, who forged a crown that ended all question of succession, if Branca commits suicide. 
Into the deep roads the survivors went, searching for Paragon Branca in hopes she could settle the unrest in Orzumar and unite the dwarves in the battle against the Archdemon. They found her, and she forged a crown that played a key role in sorting out the royal succession. If the Anvil of the Void was reclaimed. Into the deep roads the surviving wanderers went, searching for Paragon Branca in hopes she could settle this unrest in Orzumar and unite the dwarves in the battle against the Archdemon. Not only did the Paragon settle the matter of royal succession, but she also reclaimed the lost secrets of golem manufacture. An army of stone and steel joined the war effort. Ruler of Orzammar, if Prince Balan is crowned king. Balan Aedokan was crowned king of Orzammar, and the dwarven armies marched for the surface, if Lord Harrowmont is crowned king. Pyrrhal Harrowmont was crowned king of Orzammar, and the dwarven armies marched to the surface. Despite their successes, though, greater challenges were yet to come. From A Study of the Fifth Blight by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. A Study of the Fifth Blight, Volume 2. The Wardens sought Arl Eamon, uncle of the late King Caelan, in the hopes of mustering troops from the Perelden nobility. Upon arriving in Redcliffe, they learned that the Arl had fallen ill and was near death. His knights had gone in pursuit of the fabled ashes of Andraste, Eamon's only hope for a cure, and the village surrounding the keep was based, beset by a host of animated corpses. The wardens found and stopped the demon behind the undead before joining the search for Eamon's cure. If the wardens stopped the undead and liberated Le Redcliffe, the wardens sought Earl Eamon, uncle of the late King Caelan, in the hopes of mustering troops from the Ferelden nobility. Upon arriving in Redcliffe, they learned that the Earl had fallen ill and was near death. His knights would have gone to in pursuit of the fabled ashes of Andraste, Eamon's only hope for a cure, and the village surrounding the keep was beset by a host of animated corpses. The wardens found and stopped the demon behind the undead before joining the search for Eamon's cure. If the warden left Redcliffe without lending their help, the Erdens sought the wardens sought Arl Eamon, uncle of the late King Caelan in the hopes of mustering troops from the Perelden nobility. But upon arriving in Redcliffe, they learned that the Earl had fallen ill and was near death, his knights gone in pursuit of the fabled Ashes of Andraste, as his only hope for a cure. The wardens immediately set out to join the search for the Ashes. No one is certain if the wardens actually located the final resting place of Our Lady Andraste, but whatever they found saved the Earl of Redcliffe. Upon his recovery, Eamon Garen called for a landsmeet, and he and the wardens travelled to Denarim. If Loghain was constricted into the wardens, and Anora and Alistair became king and queen. The gathered lords and ladies of Ferelden found Terran Loghain guilty of a number of crimes. He was sentenced to join the Grey Wardens to atone for his deeds. Furthermore, the landsmeet were witness to the betrothal of Queen Anora to Alistair Therin, the lost son of Marek. If Loghain was conscripted into the Wardens and Anora remained queen with Warden Councilland as Prince Consort, the gathered lords and ladies of Ferelden found Terran Loghain guilty of a number of crimes. He was sentenced to join the Grey Wardens to atone for his deeds. Furthermore, the Landsmeet bore witness to the betrothal of Queen Anora to Terran Bryce Cowsland's youngest son, who was one of the two Grey Wardens to survive Ostagar. If Loghain was constricted into the Wardens and Anora remained queen, the gathered lords and ladies of Perelden found Terran Loghain guilty of a number of crimes. He was sentenced to join the Grey Wardens to atone for his deeds. Furthermore, the landsmen granted the vacant throne to Anora, widow of King Caelan. If Loghain was executed and Anora remained the queen, the gathered lords and ladies of Ferelden found Terran Loghain guilty of a number of crimes and sentenced him to execution. Furthermore, the landsmeet granted the vacant throne to Anora, widow of King Caelan. If Loghain was executed and Anora and Alistair became kin and queen. The gathered lords and ladies of Ferelden found Terran Loghain guilty of a number of crimes and sentenced him to execution. Furthermore, the landsmeet bore witness to the betrothal of Queen Anora to Alistair Theron, the lost son of Merrick. If Loghain was executed, Alistair became king and was married to Warden Cowsland as queen. 
the gathered lords and ladies of Perelden found Tern Loghain guilty of a number of crimes and sentenced him to execution. Furthermore, the Lensmead granted the throne to Alistair Thurin, the lost son of Merrick, and bore witness to his betrothal to Tern Bryce Cousin's daughter. If Loghain was executed and Alistair became king, the gathered lords and ladies of Perelden found Tern Loghain guilty of a number of crimes and sentenced him to execution. Furthermore, the Lensmead granted the throne to Alistair Thurin, the lost son of Merrick. The nobility then pledged their own armies in the battle against the Blight. If the Warden perished in the final battle, the Archdemon clashed with the Allied forces of the city of Denerim and was eventually slain, but at a terrible cost. Much of the city lay in ruin and the Warden, who rallied the armies, later known as Hero of Ferelden, perished in battle. If the Dark Ritual was completed, the Archdemon clashed with the Allied forces of the city of Denerim and was eventually slain, but at a terrible cost. Much of the city was lain in ruin. The warden who rallied the armies was named the hero of Ferelden and accorded the highest honor. The fifth blight ended before most of Therais knew it began, but it left a terrible wound of Ferelden. The losses suffered at Ostagar and Denerim greatly compromised the security of the kingdom. Southern Ferelden from the Korkari West to the edge of the Bannern are, to this day, a wasteland. It's uncertain how far the ripples from this event shall travel, or what waves it had already stirred. From a study of the Fifth Blight by Sister Petrine, Chantry Scholar. Surface Dwarves In Arzamar, dwarven society is divided into rigid castes, with houses that compete for power and prestige. But all that is discarded with a dwarf abandons the stone for the surface. Under the open sky, everyone is equal. Or so the story goes. The truth is that thousands of years of tradition are not so easily tossed aside. Even though the surface dwarves are officially stripped of the cast, many maintain a hierarchy among themselves. Along the old caste lines. Formerly, noble houses are accorded more respect to the castless brands who come up in search of opportunity. The poorest noble dwarf on the surface looks upon the rich lower caste dwarves with contempt. Upper-class surface dwarf society is roughly divided into two camps, Kalnas, who insist on maintaining caste, and Drank, typically those from the noble or merchant caste families, and Ascendants, who believe in leaving Orzammar's traditions underground and embracing life in the sunlit world. Maintaining some tie to Orzammar was seen for generations as the only lifeline for surface dwarves. Bringing surface goods to their kin underground and delirium and metals to the surface was not only the most lucrative means of making a living, but also a sort of sacred duty as many surface dwarves willingly accepted exile and the loss of their caste to better serve their house or patron. In recent years, many surface dwarves, particularly ascendants, have branched out. They started banks, mercenary companies and overland trade caravans. They became investors and speculators in purely surface trade. These new industries have proven tremendous sources of wealth, but are looked down upon by their more conservative kin. For less affluent surface dwarves, association with a powerful Kalna can open many doors. They can get credit with dwarven merchants or are offered work opportunities by the powerful dwarven merchants guild more readily, sometimes, than more qualified but less connected individuals. From the The Wages Field Guide to Good Society by Lady Alkine. Tal Vashoth. Being lost in an ancient Taventer ruin in northern Rivain is highly overrated. And then I found myself beset by several bands of Kinari apparently working in concert. I fled and managed to hide in a little village by the name of Vindar. The people there, mostly humans and a few elves, were devout followers of the Kun. It was the most organized village I have ever laid eyes on. The houses were identical and arranged along perfectly orthogonal lines. The fields were well tended and apparently communal. But there were signs of damage everywhere, as if the town had suffered repeated sieges, buildings shattered, fields burned, and a great many empty houses. I spent the night in the home of a vendor's matriarch, who introduced herself as seer. When I tried to regain my hostess with the tale of my cunaria silence, I discovered something. Kunari, Seer said, are people who follow the Kun. Her people. 
those born into Canary society who reject the cune are called Vashat, which means grey ones. These grey ones must leave their homes, for they have no place among the Canary. Sadly, many turn against the society that casts them out. These outcasts call themselves Tavashat, the true grey ones. Often, when they have no skills to make as an honest living, so they sell themselves into service, usually becoming mercenaries. Even the most inept fighter among the Kunari race possesses prodigious size and an intimate visage. These she informed me were my attackers in the countryside, the same band that wrecked such havoc on Vindar. The Tal Bashot were a bitter against the Kun, the Kunari, and sometimes against order itself. They are no match for the Kunari army so they generally strike at farms, travelers, and those who stray too far from Kunari protection. I was lucky to escape with my life. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar, by Brother Genotivi. The Tale of Eloran In the days after the rising of Zazikiel, the Dark Ones covered every corner of the land. The Archdemon drove all the nations of the world before him, Shemlan and Elven alike. In the far north, where the hills wander the plains and the earth is eternally baked beneath the uncaring sun, the lands which the Shemlan call Underfells, a clan of our people lived, struggling to survive the blight. Ilren was their keeper, a hunter in his younger days, crafty as any wolf. He led his people always just ahead of the darkspawn who chased them, but the old hunter knew that even Hala cannot run forever. They must turn and fight, or be run down. At the foot of the Mardane, the darkspawn cornered Eloran's clan. That night, the moon was strangled by clouds, the air concealed by a dread mist that rose out of nowhere, so that the elven could not tell up from down. In the confusion, the darkspawn attacked. But Eloran had prepared for them. All around the camp, the hunters had strewn dry grass, brush and brambles. When the sound of rustling footfalls began, Eloran and the other Haran called upon the old magic. They struck out with lightning, and though the bolts missed the darkspawn, they hit their target all the same. The sea of kindling lit, and not one of the dark creatures made it through the fire to reach Eloran's clan. From the Tale of Eloran, written by Zafran, as it has been passed down from keeper to keeper from generations. Templars Often portrayed as stoic and grim, the Order of Templars was created as the martial arm of the Chantry. Armed with the ability to dispel and resist magic, in addition to their formidable combat talents, the Templars are uniquely qualified to act as both a foil for apostates, mages who refuse to submit to the authority of the Circle, and a first line of defense against the dark powers of blood mages and abominations. While mages often resent the Templars as symbols of the Chantry's control over magic, the people of Terra see them as saviors and holy warriors, champions of all that is good, armed with piety enough to protect the world from the ravages of foul magic. In reality, the Chantry's militant arm looks first for skilled warriors with unshakable faith in the Maker, with a flawless moral center as a secondary concern. Templars must carry out their duty with an emotional distance, and the Order of Templars prefers soldiers with religious fervor and absolute loyalty over paragons of virtue, who might question orders when it comes time to make difficult choices. The Templars' power derives from the substance lyrium, a mineral believed to be the raw element of creation. While mages use lyrium in their arcane spells and rituals, Templars ingest the primordial mineral to enhance their abilities to resist and dispel magic. Lyrium use is regulated by the Chantry, but some Templars suffer from Lyrium addiction, the effects of which include paranoia, obsession, and dementia. Templars knowingly submit themselves to this treatment in the service of the Order and the Maker. It is this sense of ruthless piety that most frighten mages when they draw the Templars' attention. When the Templars are sent to eliminate a possible blood mage, there is no reasoning with them and if the Templars are prepared, the mage's magic is all but useless. Driven by their faith, the Templars are one of the most feared and respected forces in Thedas.
from Patterns Within Form by Halden, First Enchanter of Starkhaven, 880+. Tevinter, the Magisters Before it came, became the Imperium, Tevinter was ruled by a dynasty of kings. And long before the Chantry there was a circle of Magi, the society of mages in each city. The titles our modern circles use, Enchanter, Senior Enchanter, First Enchanter, or originated here. But above the first enchanter, the circles of Tevinter had another office, Magista. The Magisters formed a council of the most powerful mages in the kingdom. They convened in Rathus and held dominion over all magic in the land. When Darinius seized the throne in minus 1195 ancient, the court of the Magisters became the royal court and Magister, was the only title of nobility recognized in the winter. The Imperium today is a magocracy. Political power is solely in the hands of the magisters, who come only from the ranks of the circle. Every young mage aspires to be a magister's apprentice because it's the best chance of ascending to the rank of magister themselves. From Black City, Black Divine, a study of the Tevinter Imperium by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. The Tranquil the Tranquil are the least understood but most visible members of the Circle. Every city of respectable size boasts a Circle of Magi shop, and every one of these shops is run by a Tranquil proprietor. The name is a misnomer, for they are not Tranquil at all, rather they are like inanimate objects that speak. If a table wished to sell you an enchanted penknife, it could pass as one of these people. Their eyes are expressionless, their voice monotone. Incomparable craftsmen they might be, but they are hardly the sort of mages to put ordinary folk at ease. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by a Brother Ridden TV. Valaslin, Blood Writing After my encounter with the Dalish elves on the road to Navarra, I studied every book on the elves I could find. I sought out legends and myths and history and tried to make sense of it all. But there is only so much one can learn from books. I knew that in order to truly understand the Dalish, I would have to seek them out. A dreadful idea in hindsight. In my defense, I was young, and also inebriated when the idea popped into my head. Unfortunately, even after I had regained some measure of sobriety, the idea still held appeal. It proved remarkably resistant to my attempts to ignore it. I gave in after months of that nagging thought at the back of my head and set out to learn about the Dalish first hand. I tramped through the forest bordering Orlay for weeks before I finally found, or was found by, a Dalish hunter. I stumbled into one of his traps and suddenly was hanging from a tree with a rope above my ankles. So there I was, defenseless, upside down with my robe over my head, my underclothes on display. Descriptions of my predicament might elicit laughter these days, but trust me when I say it was a situation I would not wish on anyone. Thankfully, my ridiculous appearance may have caused my captor to stay his hand, what Fred is a silly human with his pants showing. And so he sat, made a small fire, and began to skin the deer he had caught. I soon mustered the courage to speak. I tried to assure him that I was not there to harm him. But he laughed at this, and replied that if I were there to harm him, I had failed terribly. Eventually we got to talking, and when I say talking, I mean I that I ask him questions that he occasionally would dine to an answer. He told me that while some Dalish actively seek out human travelers to rob or frighten, most of his people would rather be left alone. He seemed to believe that punishing the humans for past actions only led to more violence. I asked him about the intricate tattoos on his face. He told me they were called Valaslin, blood writing. His were symbols of Andruil the Huntress, one of the most highly revered elven goddesses. He said the Dalish marked themselves to stand out from humans and from those of their kin who have chosen to live under human rule. He said the Valaslin reminded his people that they might never again surrender their beliefs. When he finished skinning the deer, he cut me down. By that time I had righted myself and conquered the dizziness of all blood rushing out of my head, he was gone. I do not recommend that my readers seek out the Dalish for themselves. I was very lucky to have met the man that I did, and to have walked away from our meeting unscathed. 
Perhaps the Maker watches over those who seek knowledge with an open heart. I certainly would like to think so. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genetili The Veil I detest this notion that the veil is some manner of invisible curtain that separates the world of the living from the world of the spirits. Whether it be called the fade or the beyond is a matter of racial politics I refuse to indulge in at the moment. There is no this side and this side when it comes to the veil. One cannot think of it as a physical thing or a barrier or even a shimmering wall of holy light. Thank you very much for that image, your perfection. Think of the veil instead as opening your eyes. Before you had opened them, you saw our world as you see it now. Static, solid, unchanging. Now that they are open, you see our world as the spirits see it. Chaotic, ever-changing, a realm where the imagined and the remembered have as much substance as that which is real. More, in fact. A spirit sees everything as defined by will and memory, and this is why they are so very lost when they cross the veil. In our world, imagination has no substance. Objects exist independently of how we remember them or what emotions we associate with them. Mages alone possess the power to change the world with their minds, and perhaps this forms the nature of the demon's attraction to them. Who can say? Regardless, the act of passing through the veil is much more about changing one's perception than a physical transition. The veil is an idea, it is the act of transition itself, and it is only the fact that both living beings and spirits find the transition difficult that gives the veil any credence as a physical barrier at all. From A Desertion of the Fate as a Physical Manifestation by Marino, Senior Enchanter of the Menorhus Circle of Magi, 655 Steel. Other of Antiva. These brightly painted bows are prized possessions among the Antivan pirates. A rain of arrows can clear the deck of an approaching ship and light fire to its sails. Apostate's Courage. Among the Magi, some still whisper of Caleb the Renegade. Seeking freedom from the Mede Templar's heel, he fled the country, the Chantry, the cabal of his most loyal acolytes. They reached the mountains before the winter squalls and lived there as free men for one glorious season. The spring thaws brought a vast mercenary army, however, paid for and led by the Templar Order. Wanting to avoid bloodshed, Caleb and his acolytes surrendered peaceably and allowed themselves to be made tranquil. Knight of the Stan This heavy Hunari sword is exquisitely balanced. Although no nicks mar the edge, the blood stains on the leather grip suggest that it has seen its share of battle. Ring of Resilience This faceted iron ring pulses with a mysterious energy. As the beating of your heart increases, so does the intensity of its glow. Seeker's Bulwark Emblazoned with the symbols of the Chantry Templars and greatly scarred from use, this large iron shield bears an unseen weight. It has been warded against magic to better protect the seekers who wield it in the pursuit of apostate mages.